I want to share with you a story. that uh, I experienced a number of years ago. And it was so powerful, it was so moving to me, that uh, I really feel I want to share it with you. This is what happened. Corona broke out. Purim time, you remember? Purim time, March 2020. But nobody knew if you would have told somebody on Hanukkah or even a few weeks after Hanukkah that in a few weeks, you know, 7.7 .7 billion people will be brought to their knees and every mall and shul, lahavdil and bowling alley and pizza shop and store in the world will be closed down <laughs> without a terror attack, without a third world war. Nobody, nobody would think you're crazy. <laughs> It's even hard to believe that it happened, right? The Shliach, the Chabad Shliach to Rostov on the Dan River in Russia phoned me in the early winter and he said that this year, Bez Nissen, this is 2020, Bez Nissen, the second day of Nissen, Tov Shin Pei, 2020, 5,780, mm -hmm. is exactly 100 years of the yard site of the Debed Hashab. Rebbe Rasha passed away, Beis Nissen Tafresh Pei, 1920 in Rostov. He escaped from the Germans during the First World War. He didn't want to be under the Germans, so he escaped in 1914. He escaped from Lubavitch, Belarus, to Rostov. He settled there. He lived there the last few years, and he's buried in Rostov. He passed away Beis Nissen. So he said, in honor of 100 years, he wants to make a huge event. Rostov is a little bit of a neglected city. To honor the Rebbe Rashab. A whole week of learning his Maimadim and his Chassidus. And they asked me if I could come. So I agreed. Came the month of Adar. I started to appear for the trip. And I see my passport. It's going to be in, within six months of expiration. I can't use my passport. And the trip was very, very soon. It was already in the middle of, it was right before Putin. And I realized that I have to leave in two weeks. I'm not going to get my passport on time. In Muncie, there's a lady known as the passport lady. I don't know how I came across, somewhere on ad, I guess, the passport lady, to expedite your passport. So I phoned the passport lady. She gets on the phone. And I say, I have an urgent situation. I have to get to Rostov. I see my passport is not going to work. How fast can you get it for me? She said a week, a week and a half. I said, perfect. That's what I need. Because I had to go with the end of Ba'adr, the beginning of Nisan. Mm -hmm. Come to my house. We'll take pictures. And we'll move it along. So I got into my car. I get to her, go to her house. Spring Valley, a few minutes from where I live. Not far from here. And I come into her house. I see her husband is learning Meseches Psachim. So I start schmoozing with him. He tells me he has to finish Psachim to make us see him on Erev Pesach. See, so holding in the beginning, Psachim is a big Mesechta, 120 blots, a little more. He says, yeah, I do quite a few blot a night, and we fell finish Erev Pesach Psachim. Okay, we take the pictures for the passport, and... Everything is good. I'm about to leave. Good night. Thank you very much. Call me up when it's here so I could get it and go to Russia. She looks at me and she says, Rabbi Jacobson, I have to, I owe you a debt of gratitude. I said, I'm not sure we've met before. I'm, you owe me a gratitude? She says, yeah. I said, why do you owe me a debt of gratitude? She says, it's a story. If you want to hear it. I said, I would love to hear it. So she tells me as follows. She says, I have a son. His name is Shmuli. We have a beautiful family. Shmuli is a beautiful child. But the yeshiva system didn't work for him. And a number of years ago, the whole system of Judaism stopped working for him. And he left Yiddishkeit. My husband and I knew from day one, we are staying close to our son. 
no matter what anybody else thinks or wants or says, we will remain very close to our child. And we did. And he moved out and he moved on. And he was going about his life in his own way. And at some point we heard that he met a young Jewish woman from Lakewood who also parted ways from her parents and went on her own path. And the two grew a liking towards each other. And the liking intensified. And at some point they decided they want to get married. And she's from Lakewood. They want to get married in Lakewood. They're not religious at this point. But they want to get married. Jewish boy, a Jewish girl. Wonderful. And he tells me he wants a regular wedding. Some friends said, what are you going to spend $40,000, $50,000 on a wedding that you won't approve of? You're not going to approve of the music. You're not going to approve of the dancing. You're not going to approve of the dress code. You're not going to approve of some other things that are going on at the wedding. You have to spend $50,000. Buy herring. Herring, kichlach. You want some sponge cake? Design sponge cake. You can't get married today without sushi. It's a shail on the kedushin. It's not a chalais kedushin. Fine, you can get some sushi. About $50,000, $40,000. A wedding you, without, without the nachas you want. My husband and I knew, no, if this is what our son and future daughter-in-law want, they want a beautiful, nice wedding, that's what we're doing. <laughs> so we paid for a wedding with money that we didn't have, as many parents do with weddings. And uh, it was a beautiful wedding. And we invited our friends, our neighbors, they wanted a big wedding, and friends from Lakewood and friends from Muncie and relatives. And she says, you know, people make a lot of comments. People are sometimes judgmental. And they make comments, and every chachem of chelem has what to say and has an opinion. And she said, even during the wedding, there were people telling me <laughs> that I should have not squandered so much money on a wedding that, to put it mildly, did not adhere to the highest standards of Muncie and Lakewood religious culture, to put it mildly. But my husband and I celebrated. We enjoyed, our family enjoyed. We danced with the chassam, we danced with the kala. And uh, it was a very special moment, child getting married to a girl he loves and a boy she loves. We left Lakewood at 1.30 in the morning to get home to Muncie. Drive from Lakewood to Muncie is an hour and 45 minutes. For those of you who do it, even without traffic, maybe an hour and 40 minutes. They left 1.30. They knew they're going to be home around 1.45. They're going to be home around 3.30. On the way, she turns to her. She says, I turned to my husband. He was sitting right there. She's telling this to me when I'm trying to make a passport to go to the stove. On the way, I tell my husband, you know, I'm feeling down. He says, why are you feeling down? We're coming from the wedding of our son. She says, I'm feeling down because maybe it was the wrong decision. Maybe our neighbors or friends or relatives are right. I mean, let's face it, the wedding was, uh, wasn't a regular Lakewood wedding, let's put it that way. And I felt, you know, I could have done a small wedding, a private wedding. They wanted it this way, but I didn't feel so good about it. She says, I need therapy. I need somebody to talk to. He looks at her and he says, where am I going to get a therapist at 2 o'clock in the morning to come into the car with the land and a helicopter on the highway to come into the car on the road from, from Lakewood to Muncie? Where am I going to get a therapist? So she tells me, I turn to my husband and I say, let's put on Rabbi YY. He's a therapist in the middle of the night sometimes. So we go to YouTube, she tells me, and type in, uh, type in video, your name, yeshiva.net, whatever she typed in. And she says, a video comes up. So I press play. She tells me, I kid you not, as I press play, you're sitting there at a table, and you say, I want to share a story. So we're driving, we're exhausted. You know the drive from Lakewood to Muncie in the middle of the night. Yeah, you do it. It's a killer. Huh? 
the worst, right? Why? It's boring. It's boring, yeah. The highway is boring. The matzav is boring. Unless you have something really good going on in the car, which some of you I know have, it's, it, it's not what you wish on your enemies. It's like a bore, really, it's one of those drives, you know what I mean? Like, even if you're not tired, you want to fall asleep. Even if you're not tired. And she tells me, you start telling a story. What's the story? The story I shared that she listened to at that moment, at that drive. I said, I heard, I was standing, this is already me telling the story. I was standing at a Levaya. I was standing at a funeral in front of 770. This was many, many years ago. The coffin was late. The iron was late. So I was waiting there. Near me was standing a Jew who was close to 90 at the time. Today he's in the Oil of His name was Reb David Edelman. Reb David Edelman lived in Springfield, Massachusetts. He built a yeshiva there, Achet Mimim, which he led for pro- pro- approximately 50 years till his passing. Today it's continued by his family, his children. Reb David was standing right near me on Eastern Parkway on the service line. We were waiting. I turned to him and I said, Reb David, tell me a story. She says, I'll tell you a story that I experienced firsthand right here. And he pointed to 770. He says, right here. I opened up my, I opened my ears. And Reb David says it was 1943. Tovshin Gimel. So this was approximately 60 or 70 years later. <laughs> 70, 70 years later. And maybe even 75 years later. He was a yid, he was almost 90. And he says, I learned in time chitmimim, I learned in 770 in the 40s. I was an American boy, and I learned in the yeshiva, time chitmimim labavich. It was break time. It was the afternoon break, you know, lunch time, mincha time, after mincha. Around 2 o'clock, 2.30, 1.30, that time in the afternoon. I was standing with my chaver, a classmate, Herschel Fogelman, Rabbi Yehuda Tzvi Fogelman, also on the Isle of today. He lived in Worcester, Massachusetts. He had a yeshiva in Worcester for 50, 60 years. Herschel Fogelman, Rabbi Yehuda Tzvi Fogelman, Zechroinam Levrach, was standing by the elevator. That's the place where the Rebbe would later give dollars. The elevator. There's a magnet there. You know the room, right? The four, you come into 770, upstairs, that little room where the Rebbe would give dollars. We were standing there and schmoozing. I think he said we were smoking a cigarette. Probably, recess, 1943, the whole way of 770, probably. I don't remember if he said that. But we were schmoozing. I asked him, what were you schmoozing about? He says, I don't remember. 1943. He says, you schmooze with you know, at the afternoon break. What do you talk about? I don't know if they were talking about Roosevelt or Churchill, or probably football. Huh? The Yankees, yeah. I don't know if they were punk Yankees fan, Yankee fans, but uh, Shaykh. Huh? Could be the Dodgers, 1943. It's before L.A. stole uh, our team. 1956, this is 1943, yeah. Ebbets Field. Ebbets Field. Nishpashat. There were people I knew who hid their ticket. The Shabbos was a game. They had their tickets buried by the fence to be able to go on Shabbos. Yeah, I knew, I knew, I knew, I knew a few people. It was a big Shabbos thing. Anyway, he tells me we're standing by the elevator in the afternoon and we're schmoozing. Me, David Edelman, and, and Yehuda Tzvi Fogelman. The door opens up, the door of a room that would later be known as Ganeid Natacht, the room pre the Rebbe's room. It opens up. Who comes out? He tells me the Ramash comes out. As you probably know, the Ramash was the title of the Rebbe at the time. Reish Mem Shin. That's what they called the Rebbe. During the years of the Friedrich Rebbe, of the Rebbe Rayaz, the Rebbe was his second son-in-law. The oldest son-in-law was the Rashag, Rebbe Shmaya Gerari, and the Rebbe was called the Ramash. Out of respect. That's what they called him, the Ramash. So the Ramash comes out of the door. And he sees us standing in schmoozing. So the David tells me the Rebbe, lady would become the Rebbe, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, looks at us and he says, Irvilt Heren, 
a frischen Wort von Rebben? Are you interested in hearing a fresh Wort, something new? As you say, right out of the oven that I heard from the Rebbe. The Rebbe, of course, meant the Rebbe's father-in-law, the Rebbe Rayatz, whose yard site is today, Yudshvat. Do you want to hear something, a new Wort I heard from the Rebbe? They said, of course, Avada. So the Ramash, the Rebbe starts telling them, he tells them, and he gives them the background. He says, as you know, here in 770, there come different types of Jews. People come to visit. So it certainly wasn't a big shul then. Downstairs was a garage. Upstairs was a little shul. It wasn't a big meal, but people would come. The Lubavitcher Rebbe was there. The, previ- the Rebbe Dayatz was there. People would come. So he said, the Rebbe said, people come, and different types of Jews. There are many Jews who come visit that on the other side of the Atlantic, they were religious. They crossed the Atlantic Ocean like many Jews. They threw away their tefillin. They threw away Yiddishkeit. They wanted to become part of the melting pot of the American dream. They sent their children to non-Jewish schools. There were so few Jewish schools. They stopped keeping Torah mitzvahs. They come here. They visit for whatever reason. He says, my custom is I'm very warm to them. <laughs> I greet them warmly. I welcome them with a smile. And I am hospitable to them. I make them feel comfortable. And he said, There are older Chabad Chassidim who chastise me. And they tell me what you're doing is wrong. If you show warmth to a Jew who knows better, he used to be religious, and he became secular, you're giving a heksher. You're making him feel that what he's doing is fine, is valid. What you should be doing is protesting, condemning, expelling, Showing them the door. Telling them what you really think about them. Don't play uh, nice, cute, charming games with them to make believe you agree with them. Musr, you have to rebuke them. You are responsible because you make them feel that they're welcome. This is, the Rebbe said, what El Chassidim, Chabad Chassidim told me. It's a wrong behavior. Listen to this. So the Rebbe tells David Edelman and Heschel Fogelman, the Elder Bachrim, he says, <laughs> I didn't know who's right. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they're right. So today, I went to the Rebbe, some Shver, my father-in-law, and I told him. I asked him the question. I said, we have a debate in 770 if we should be, if we should embrace secular Jews or we should distance them. We should protest. Make them feel unwelcome until they do tshuva. When they repent, they can come back. I shared with my father-in-law both sides. This is what the Rebbe meant, a frisha word for Rebbe, a new word. He says, and this is what the Rebbe makes us. The Rebbe would call him the Rebbe. He says, Rebbe, the Rebbe, the Shver, the Rebbe, the father, his father-in-law. He says, this is what he told me. And Rebbe David Edelman repeated what he heard from the Rebbe. This is 70 years before. From his memory in Yiddish, I'll say it in English. One word I'm going to say in Yiddish, you'll see why. He said, my father-in-law told me, Hashem created the world in a way that parents, by nature, love their children with an awesome, intense, infinite love. If you're a healthy, normal, functional human being, when you have a child, you just are filled with affection to the child. In fact, the love fills your whole heart. You would think there's no place for more love. It's like, where are you going to get more love from? But when a second child is born, your heart is filled with absolute, endless love to the second child. And when a third child is born, it's not like, okay, that's it. The reservoir of love is depleted. You can go to another house. A healthy father and mother, somehow, there's a new infinite love to the third child. And so it continues with every child who's born. And then the Rebbe Rayat said, Sada Amol, or Sada Akind, what is Abalmum? A child is born or a child develops an illness or a disease or a child has a disability or a deformity or a challenge, physical, Emotional, psychological. 
And the parents look at this child struggling. Every move is a struggle. Walking is a struggle. Talking is a struggle. Growing is a struggle. They look at this child and they know how much this child is going to have to deal with in a difficult world. So the Rebbe tells the Ramash, he says, Farazakind, Habenze, and he said, and this is the word he used in Yiddish, an eigen altik I don't know how many of you know a good Yiddish, but you know what eigen artik means? Eigen artik means something unique, unprecedented, out of the world, out of this world. Eigen artik a special love. I will ask me, they already love the regular children infinitely. That's true. But for this child, due to the struggle, due to the empathy that they have, they see what he's going through or she's going through, their heart experiences something special. There's a tenderness. There's a compassion. There's a connection with this child precisely because of what he or she has to deal with. And the Rebbe Dayatz looks at the Rebbe and he says, this is a marshal, it's a metaphor. The Ebishter had lib yedn yidn mit umbagrenitz the lipshaft. Hashem loves every Jew with unlimited love. And it's no difference who and when and where. Bonim atem Hashem alakeicha. The love of the Rebbeinu Shalom to a Jew is non negotiable, eternal. Absolute and endless. And the fact that there's another one doesn't take away from the first. The famous word from the Baal Shem Tev, Hashem loves every Jew more than parents love an only child that was born when they were elderly and they didn't think they can have a child. Even that doesn't come close to the love of Hashem to a Jew. He says, the Nach is malayid. And he says, sometimes there's a Jew. He said, I felt in tefillin. A Jew who doesn't put on tefillin. He said, Feltach in the autumn. It says that the, the Avery HaGuf and the Avery HaNesham are connected. The Guf and the Nesham are one, they're connected. So the Jew doesn't put on tefillin, there's something missing in his Jewish arm. A Jew doesn't give tzedakah. There's something missing in his hand. He said, a Jew whose head is not occupied with goodness and holiness and tired, there's something missing in the brain. And he went through different limbs of the body that there's sometimes a Jew who's missing certain aspects of his or her life, and there's something missing. There's something missing in the soul. So he says, when Hashem sees such a Jew, he says, For this Jew who's struggling, there's a special love because of the setbacks, because of the failure, because of the challenges, because of the void. There's a special love, an Egen Artik Lipshaft. Says the Schwer, my father looked at me and he said, Do Fizich with the You behave like Asha. Love every Jew infinitely. And when you see a Jew who's missing something, you see a Jew who's challenged with something, then love him much more. Keep him much closer. Keep her much closer. This is what the Rebbe answered. The Friedrich Rebbe answered the Rebbe on his question, who's right? The Chassidim, the other Chassidim of him. So what he told Rebbe David Edelman, and here's the follow. He said, you think about it. That the Lubavitcher Rebbe in 1943 had a question. <laughs> if you should be car of secular Jews or not. Right? He had a question. And there were two sides. It's hard to believe the Rebbe had this question. And he went to his Rebbe. And when the Rebbe Dayatz answered, once he answered, that was it. There was no looking back, as we all know. As they say, the rest is history. But to think about that by the Rebbe was a serious question. What's the right approach? Maybe I'm wrong. Once he heard from his Rebbe what the right approach is, we all know that was it. <laughs> there was never another way. But to think that the Rebbe himself had this dilemma in his own life, what's the right path? So the passport lady says to me, I'm listening. It's, I said it's a long story. It's now 2, 2, 2, 30 in the morning. I'm listening to this story, which went on as I'm driving, as we're driving back. 
She said, I don't know what to tell you. My, my heart, my heart was swelling with such gratitude as we're returning from this wedding where we embraced our children and we had so much fun with them and we enjoyed and we spent all the money and people made some comments. And then I heard what the Rebbe said over that he heard from his father-in-law. He says, literally, there couldn't have been a better message that I and my husband needed to hear at that time. And for this, I'm grateful. That's why I wanted to express gratitude. I go home. I come into my house. And I tell my wife the story. And my wife says, wow. Why do you think this is the story that came on YouTube? I said, I know the algorithms of YouTube. I would be a billionaire if I knew the algorithms, yeah? Ich weiß how YouTube works. They certainly don't have Ruach HaKodesh. But algorithms sometimes have <laughs> some interesting skills. It's interesting, why did this come up? <clears throat> I call her up, I call up a uh, passport lady, and I say, which day was the wedding? <laughs> you won't believe me. Which day was the wedding? You're not going to believe this part of the story. She says, it was just now. That's why I'm thanking you. I said, what do you mean just now? It's now on other. When was this wedding? This was March. She says, February 5th, February 5th. I take a calendar, I open up the calendar, February 5th is Yud Shvat. <laughs> Yud Shvat, Tovshin Pei was February 5th. I had a Fabregen. <laughs> there was a Fabregen in the tent in Archaim by Shainer's Shul. It was one in the morning, two in the morning, whatever it was, we were Fabregen. <laughs> and I said the story. She was coming home from the chas in the Mitzvah Yud Shvat. She put it on. I was telling the story about the Fri de Kerebbe and the Rebbe for Yud Shvat. The wedding was on Yud Shvat, literally, February 5th. So I tell her, you know that Yud Shvat is the yard site of the Rebbe Rayatz, who said this to his son-in-law. She said, I didn't know. I didn't know. I said, look, the wedding was Yud Shvat. You're coming home. You don't know if it was right or wrong. And you put on, you put on the video and you hear this part from the Balei Lula on his yard site. So she starts crying. I say, why are you crying? I thought she was crying. It was emotional. She said, there's another part of the story I didn't tell you. I'm like, what's the other part of the story you didn't tell me? She says, you know, I didn't grow up as, uh, in a very Jewish home. I grew up in a very secular Jewish home. I'm like, I don't know your story. You didn't speak about you. You spoke about your son. So she says, my father, his name was jo Josh Zuatsky. He was born in Brooklyn in 1933. Her father. Both of his parents died when he was a baby. So his uncle and aunt took him in. The uncle was, had a connection to Judaism. So in 1944, when my father was 11 years old, <laughs> my uncle took him to get a blessing from the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe, 1944, 11 year old boy. And he brings in my father to the Rebbe, Rayatz, Josh Zuatsky. And he introduces him, he's an orphan, he has no father, no mother, he's growing up with his uncle. And he says, the Rebbe Rayatz looks at my father, he understood Yiddish, they all understood Yiddish. And he tells him, he says, America is a difficult place. America is a challenging place. And there's a lot of nisyoinus in America. It's very easy to lose your way in this, in this country. Vilich de geben abracha. I want to give you a blessing to this Josh, 11 years old. What's the blessing? As the Abish Tevet Halfen, as Trotz Alanis Yoinis, despite all the challenges, Vestuzen, Lichtike Yiddish Nachas, from deine Kinder und Kindskinder. You'll see amazing Jewish Nachas from your children and your grandchildren. 11 years old. He left the room. He grew up. Like all the kids, he went to a public high school. A few years later, he had no connection to Judaism. And he moved from all places to San Diego. 
San Diego, he opened a perfume store, made a lot, a lot of money in the West Coast. And the West Coast then was a desert within deserts. He met a Jewish girl in the 50s, and they married a secular Jewish girl, and they had two Jewish daughters. They lived in San Diego. He made a very good living, but they grew up completely secular. One day in the 1970s, she tells me the Lubavitcher Rebbe decided to send a shliach to San Diego. And one day, my father is in a supermarket, and he sees a man with a yarmulke and a beard and payas. He thought he's hallucinating. It's like a UFO landed, you know, straight from Mars into San Diego. So the early 70s, it was unheard of. My father said, who are you? He says, I'm a Lubavitcher Chassid. I said, Lubavitcher Chassid, what are you doing here? So I came to build Yiddishkeit here. He says, what do you have? He says, I opened a shul. You want to come? And he says, I know Lubavitch. I was by the Lubavitch Rebbe in 1944. You don't have to tell me. He says, you've been in shul? He says, well, not in 60, uh, not in 40 years. He says, Yisker, we don't do anything. Come to shul. We have a good kiddush. The cholent is good. You know what it is. He says, okay, I'll come in. He comes in, and you know, sometimes you fa he falls in love. He loves the rabbi, he loves the place, he loves the company. Probably like the Cholent Toso, the Kichlach, whatever they had then in the Kiddush of the 70s. It's before the Kiddush Club was invented, so whatever they had, Kichlach and Cholent. But they had something. This is the 70s, and he falls in love with the place. He comes back every Shabbos, you know, before golf, before golf, he comes to the Chaban House, it's the minig of many people in California. And he got really close to the rabbi, I think it was Rabbi Frat, Fratkin in San Diego. And uh, one day, his daughter is telling me, he comes to me, I'm a teenager, and he says, why don't you come with me to the synagogue of the Chabad house in San Diego? I says, they say, Daddy, when are you going? Saturday. Saturday we go to disco with my sister. We don't go to synagogue. He said, before you go to disco, you come to the synagogue, then you'll go to disco and dance with the boys. I'm not interested. We're not religious. What are you? you? You got hooked. You got indoctrinated. Don't blame us. He says, come. There's an interesting class. I don't know. Life after death. Some interesting class. So he said, just to do our old man a favor. He was a nice man. We liked him. To do him a favor, I came with my sister. And we came to the class. We sat at the class. And I have to say, it was very meaningful. It was, it was very, it was inspiring. It was meaningful. It made me think about things that I didn't think about and I didn't want to think about, but I really did want to think about. And somehow we went to disco and I told my sister afterwards, the class was more meaningful than the dancing and the drinking. There was something more. So we came back the next week and we got involved. And a year later, we found ourselves growing in Yiddishkeit together with our father. And we both tell our father we want to go to a Jewish seminary. <laughs> so him, together with the Chabad Shlich, they send the sisters to Eretz Yisrael to go study in a seminary. And she says, and when I had to get married, <laughs> I married my husband, who's soon going to finish Masech Psachim for Erev Pesach. And my sister got married, somebody I think in Toronto, also a yeshiva bachadol. And we built families. My father... My father, he says, we were living on the East Coast. So my father came. He was already an older man. He started to keep Shabbos. He started to keep kosher. And he was sitting one day around the table, looking at all of his grandchildren, singing the Shabbos songs. And he looks at me and he says, in 1944, <laughs> I was by the Lubavitcher Rebbe. And he told me, America is a tough place. But you're going to see lichtik Yiddish and nachas from your children and your grandchildren. This is what the Lubavitcher Rebbe told my father, Josh Swatsky, in 1944. She said, but there was one boy, Shmuley, who was struggling. And this was the boy everybody had a question about. But my husband and I knew what to do. And on the way back from his wedding, we hear this story from the same Rebbe who told my father about his grandchildren, gave us the empowerment and the confidence to know that we did the right thing. This is all as I'm planning to, I got a passport to go to Rostov for the yard site of the Rebbe Rashab on business. Corona broke out a few days later. The Rostov trip was canceled. 
I never made it to Rostov. That base Nissen, Rabbi Danziger, with a few people in Rostov, went to the Tzien of the Rebbe Rashab, and that was that. So the passport I got, but it was never used for Rostov. But the story of Yud Shvat, I got instead of the going to the Rostov. Recently, I met this lady. This happened in 2020 when I made the passport. Recently, I met her. I asked her how are things going. She said, I want you to know something. Because of my closeness, our closest to my son and my daughter-in-law, they feel at home in our house. They feel like family. There's no differentiation. So we always invite them for Shabbos, no matter what they do afterwards. She says, I wanted you to know that a few weeks ago, we came for Shabbos, Shabbos afternoon, we were schmoozing, it was a nice meal, and it went very late. It was Shalashudas, I think. And then she says, my son turns to me and says, by the way, is Shabbos over yet? And I take a look and I say, yeah. He says, and within three seconds, him and my daughter-in-law jump up and they run into their rooms. <laughs> and I see that they're, they're, they went to hop their phones. And I turned to my husband and I said, look, they're keeping Shabbos. They heard Shabbos is over, they ran into the rooms. This was the epilogue that she told me not long ago when I met her. So this I wanted to share with you. Because, for obvious reasons, but just if the punchline is not clear, <laughs> it's probably pretty clear, but it's important to emphasize it again and again and again. And that is that we live today in a time where the greatest gift we can give our children, our students, ourselves, and our loved ones is safety security, love, that every child should feel safe, secure, seen, soothed. Sometimes we're triggered very badly, and there's good reasons to be triggered. And when you're triggered, you sometimes want to distance yourself and reject. And at that moment, it's incumbent upon us to internalize the words of the Baal HaYilula, do fizzich with the To love every child with infinite love. And when somebody is struggling, it's not the time to distance yourself. It's the time to explode and open your heart with an eigen artike lipshaf, with a love that is unprecedented and unparalleled. Because in life, you have to ask not what your children can do for you, but what you can do for your children. Which is another way of saying, ask not what God can do for you. But ma Hashem alakecha shayil me'imach, what Hashem wants from you at this moment. L'chaim, 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 l'chaim. Come on, let's go.
We're dancing the seven akafas, actually the first akafa, the Atkan akafa Aleph, still akafa Beis. <laughs> All the gym you didn't go to the last six months with the mushrooms and I'm banacht. It reminds me, I once heard from Reb Zalman Posner. He was a rov in Memphis, right? Nashville, Nashville, Tennessee. I lived on New York Avenue, President Plaza, 346 New York Avenue. So uh, he had an apartment there, a relative, a grand, a, somebody had an apartment there. So we would spend sukkahs once together. So he shared with me 
that Yud Shvat, he used to come to New York. He would come from Nashville to New York for Yud Shvat. One year, he came for Yud Shvat, and downstairs in 770, he was packed by the Fabrengen. And Reb Zalman posed, he, wanted, he told me he wanted to concentrate, he wanted to be able to hear what the Rebbe is saying with, with serenity, with tranquility. So he decided, why should he stay downstairs and push? Upstairs, I don't know if you know, upstairs in the little shul in the Zal, there was a hookup. From the mic, there was a hookup there. So there were like 30 people there. A few people were playing kugelach. They were always playing kugelach. A few people were eating hot dogs that they bought in Essen Bench across the street with the knishes, which more oil than knish. But it had a shame knish. And, uh, and there was a few people there. So he said, he'll go up there, he'll sit on a comfortable bench, there's a hookup, he'll be able to hear the maimeh, hear the sikhs. But menuchas hanefesh. So he was upstairs. His mazel, in the middle of the Fabrengen, the Rebbe turned to his father, Reb Shalom Posner from Pittsburgh, Rabbi Posner from Pittsburgh, and he said, who is the Zun? Who is your son, Reb Zalman? I don't see him. So Reb Shalom said, Adav Zayn, he came for your He's supposed to be here. He asked him a second time after another, Sikha, where is he? He wants he should say Lechaya. He doesn't know. So he turned to his father-in-law, Reb Shloyma Aaron Kazanovsky. He used to sit right behind the Rebbe, Rabbi Kazanovsky. He was an old chassid. He said, where's your son-in-law? He says, he's supposed to be here. They didn't know that he went upstairs. So uh, that was it. Three times he wasn't there. They never wanted he should say l'chaim and acknowledge him, but he wasn't around. So he told me that the next night or two nights later, he went on a yechidus. Before he went home, he went on a yechidus. So the Rebbe tells him, Drei mal. Three times I asked about you by the Fabrengen. Where were you? So he says the truth. He says it's very pushy down there. There's no place. Everybody's pushing. To get a good place, you have to kill yourself. I wanted to hear the Rebbe's Sikh's serenity. So I went upstairs. And I was sitting there. And I was listening. I didn't see, but I listened. Before video days. You couldn't see, but you heard. Now, he was a big rub in Nashville. He had a big shul. I don't know if you ever went to shul. So one of the big shuls. He had an Akiva. And you know these shuls? You know where the Rav sits, yeah? The old, nice, modern shuls. The Rav sits all the way. Yeah, The Rav. The Rav sits on a chair. And the president sits 120 feet away from him. They're not on speaking terms. And the Gabbai sits another 120 feet away from him. And the, the Shamish has his place. And the president of Israel. You know how it is. So the Bzalman sat over there. Vestach. We covered Malachim and these shuls enough place. Let's put it this way. It's not like 770. So he tells the Rebbe he was upstairs. So that he tells me the Rebbe looked at him and said, Rebbe Zalman, Ein mola yor, was megidir a gelegenheit, shtoysen dem choymer haguf. Und du antleufst. Once a year you have an opportunity to challenge, <laughs> to challenge the to crush a little bit the choymer, the bruteness, the density, the crassness of the ego, of the material ego, and you run away from it. <laughs> That's what he told them. I'll call upon them. So as we were dancing, and I was thinking about the story that I shared with Reb David Edelman and the passport lady, I had a memory, I shared it, but it came to me, so I want to share it. For me, I could maybe say it's a shtikl, I don't know, like a shtikl, I don't know, you do dirt tzavo, because it's not an Indian of a tzavo. Every year is stronger and more lebedic and more, more vibrant. But I guess it's a message, certainly a message. Since I grew up in Crown Heights, so the custom is that the locals didn't go every Sunday to get a dollar. Because there were so many people. You went on your birthday or once a year, if you were good, it's a special occasion. At least that's what they taught us. There was always an argument to go more, to go less, but that's what they taught us to, uh, you know, to spare the Rebbe's time and energy. It happened to be the last time the Rebbe gave dollars, I was going to Eretz Yisrael that night. 
I was a bocher. My cousin was getting married. I decided I need a little break. So I, got a, I took a trip. I convinced my parents to buy me a ticket to go to Israel for two weeks. So because I was going to Israel that night, it was Sunday night, Chavav Adarishin, Tavshinun Beis, Parshas Pekudei. So I went for dollars. I usually would not go. But I went because I was traveling that night to Israel. So I went, and I got in over there. And first I stood, I just wanted to watch a little bit what was happening, because usually you didn't see these things. I was watching people go. The Rebbe started the dollars then in the early afternoon, and this was approximately 6 o'clock, so he was already standing for around 6 hours, 5, 6, 7 hours, and uh, you know, giving everybody a dollar. And there were a lot of people who came, thousands and thousands of people, and he spoke to a lot of people. It was quite, uh, you could see on the videos today how, you know, what was going on over there every minute, something else. But I was watching it for a while. It was extraordinary. Then finally it was my time to go for a dollar. It was already getting close to the end. So I got online. And uh, I told uh, Rabbi Groner, the Bleib Groner, if he could tell the Rebbe for me that I'm going to Israel that night. My, my flight was one in the morning or 12. He said, fine. It happens to be right in front of me, there was a man, he looked French, and he looked secular, he seemed secular, and he was holding a girl, his daughter. She must have been four, five, or six, that was the age. And the way she was dressed, I understood, it's not a religious, it's not a religious family. They had a darker, spider complexion, it looked like French Jews, or from, you know, that uh, zip code. And he was holding her. She was this cute little girl. She was holding her in his hand. And they were, happened to be right, he happened to be mamish right in front of me. So the Rebbe gave him a dollar. And then the Rebbe gave his the daughter a dollar. He gave it into her hand. And he, he said to her, like he always said, Bracha v'atzlacha. I'll never forget this. She looked the Rebbe in the eyes. Mamish four years old, five years old. And very loud, she gave a scream. These words. Rebbe of Lubavitch, I love you. I saw that the secretaries around got a little, uh, what's the word, maybe queasy. It wasn't a regular conversation, you know, even though she was a little girl, you know, tell the Rebbe, I, Rebbe of Lubavitch, I love you. I saw some people, they were like a little, <laughs> a little awkward maybe. <laughs> but the Rebbe, when he heard it, he broke out in a smile. From literally from ear to ear, is I saw the Rebbe smile many times, but the way he smiled then, I have to say, it was something special, it was a, a radiance, a light. She was ready to move on with her father, but right before the Rebbe took another dollar, he gave it to her. He looked at her, and he said these words: "This is for your love." And they moved on. Then it was my turn. The smile was wiped away completely. <laughs> But Mamash, it was fascinating. <laughs> In a split millisecond, a little bit, yeah? But the Rebbe was like that, from a second to another second, it was like a different person. It was completely no smile anymore. <laughs> like, what am I, chopped liver? <laughs> I didn't think that. I was just, I just watched it. And the Bleib Grona told the Rebbe, as a fart hind in Eitz Yisrael, the Rebbe gave me a dollar, he said, Bracha v'atzloch, and then he gave me a second dollar, and he said, Ob geben of in Eretz HaKadosh. She gave it for tzedakah in the Holy Land. Those were the last words I heard from the Rebbe. The next day, Monday, was Chavzai and Adar Aleph, and at the oil, the Rebbe suffered a stroke. But that image stands in front of my eyes when he told that girl, this is for your love. He gave her a special dollar, this is for your love. In my mind, it's a very, very empowering message. Because you meet people, I meet a lot of people, and you tra travel, and you see a little bit what's going on. There's nothing that the Jewish people, individually and collectively, need as much as the feeling of closeness with each other, of real, deep, emotional love and safety. And it doesn't come so easy. We could say, I love you, I'm here for you, but there's so many defenses and so many fears, and people feel so judged. 
and when there's a genuine feeling of lack of judgmentalism, which you can only give it to somebody else, by the way, if you give it to yourself. <laughs> if you don't get, know how to give it to yourself, you can't give it not to your children, not to your spouse, not to your friends, not even to your own children who you want to give it to. If you don't know what you do with yourself, because you don't know the language. We learn the language with ourselves, then we can give it to others. So what the Rebbe said to David Edelman in 1943, how many years is that? Tavshin Gimel, Yud Gimel, Chav Gimel, Lamed Gimel, Mem Gimel. This is how we do math from where I was educated. Yud Gimel, Chav Gimel, I'll do it again because you disturbed me. Chtav Tzelen Alein. Yud Gimel, Chav Gimel, Lamed Gimel, Mem Gimel, Nun Gimel. 50, what 80? Tavshin and Beis, 49 years. I knew I can't trust you. <laughs> At least with numbers. Huh? Okay, that's as good. But Meret 49 years. I'm just joking, I trust you. 49 years. From Tavshin, Tavshin Gimel till Tavshin, Tavshin Gimel till Tavshin. 49 years, right? No outside from Betchilasa. What he heard from the, from the Rebbe Dayat. This... It's simple words, but it's the profoundest words. To be able to really, what the Rebbe was telling this girl is, you know, I'm giving you this dollar to recognize, to acknowledge, and to empower you to be able to display and embody this love. I just heard recently that I didn't know this. I saw this. I saw this myself. And somebody told me recently that he met this Yid and he became a Baltruva from this. This moment, it has, it's back from the Derefrika, but told the Rebbe, he became a Baal from this moment. When he saw that, it transformed his whole life. I didn't know that, I was just standing there, I saw it. But I want to share another moment I had. This was Pes This was the first night of Pesach. I was a child, I was before Bar Mitzvah. The Rebbe had a minhig, that out of Pesach after Mincha, he would give matzah to people, whoever wanted. But the later years, there were already a lot of people, so he would give to the Kailo. The Kailo Yungalite would come by. He would give everybody a few pounds. And they would go downstairs to Shul and they would distribute matzah to whoever wanted to get. After Maidiv, when the Rebbe came up from Maidiv, before he went home to do his own Seder with the Rebbe, son, the Rebbe would give matzah to very few people. Basically, the people that worked in his house to help the Rebbe, son, and the people that worked in his brother in law's house that are shocked to help his brother in law. And the people who worked in Moschitas, in the secretariat. Of Mamish, a few people around, maybe 10, 15 people. One of the people who happened to get matzah every year, Pesach, was my father. Hello, Vashalom. He would get matzah after Maidiv. Rabbi Chadikov would get, Rabbi Groner, Rabbi Klein, Zalman, Rabbi Zalman Gerari. Uh, Beryl Yunik, people who worked, uh, Rabbi Krinsky, Rabbi, Rabbi Simpson was in Brighton Beach, a few people. Because I was a child, so I could smuggle, you know, it was easier to get around. So I went in with my father for all the years as I could till my bar mitzvah to get matzah together with him. The Rebbe would give children, whenever he gave children matzah, he would give a, a broken piece of matzah, a piece of prusa. Now, it was never a problem to find a broken piece because in the, what you get from the matzah bakery, the problem is to find a whole piece, not to find a broken piece, right? Broken pieces, Baruch Hashem, you have a lot. To find a shleim is a chiddush. So children under my mitzvah, the Rebbe would always give a prusa, a broken piece of matzah. And adults, he would usually give one whole matzah. <coughs> so... Uh, it was one year, I went in front of my father, and it came my turn. I was standing by the Rebbe's door. It was after might of the first night of Pesach. And the Rebbe had the matzah right in his office, in his room, right by the door on a table or a chair. And he would take and he would give you, and he would say, of Pesach. The, the, it was the brown bags, you know, they pack the matzah in those brown bags. And the Rebbe looks, and there's a whole matzah on top. So he picks it up to look under to get a broken matzah because I was a kid. It's also a whole matzah. So he goes up, he goes further. It's all whole matzahs. I don't know how that happened. That from the matzah bakery on Albany Avenue, 
So Psalm Ness, Mama, like three is amazing. I don't know how it happened. There were no broken matzahs. I never saw such a thing. Anyway, the Rebbe goes the third matzah, the fourth matzah. He's, he's picking up matzah after matzah. There's no broken matzah. And the children, he always gave broken matzahs. I kid you not, he went down. It was a whole pound. It was a pound or two pounds, whatever it was. Matzah after matzah, till the last one, they were all whole matzahs. He finished. I'm thinking to myself, right? Just give me a whole matzah. Nothing is going to happen. You don't tell? I don't tell. What am I going to do with a whole matzah already? Where am I going to go with a whole matzah? I didn't say anything. I was just standing there. It was a very long time because the Rebbe was looking through the pile. The Rebbe came to the bottom of the pile. I'll never forget this. He took both of his hands, one hand on top of the other, and he turned over the whole pile, and he started to go again. In other words, he went down in one direction. Now he turned it around, and he went down again, so to speak, from bottom up. But this was the matzah turned over again to ensure because there has to be a broken matzah, and he went through the whole pile again. Matzah after matzah after matzah, but the first count was accurate. There was no broken matzah. The Rebbe finished, and there's no broken matzah. So I thought at that moment, the Rebbe will just give me a whole matzah, right? Take your matzah and get I could see, I can't tell you what the Rebbe was thinking, but I could see that the Rebbe was, so to speak, contemplating what to do. I saw that he didn't want to break a matzah. I saw. <laughs> I saw that the Rebbe was hesitant. He didn't want to take a whole matzah and break it. He didn't want to. I saw that he didn't want to. So the Rebbe moved away and went into his room, started to walk into his room to get a new, a new pound of matzah, to get a new bag of matzah. And I thought he's going to bring that, open it up, they were already untied. He just had to open it up and find the broken matzah. Because he started, he like turned around and started to walk back into the room where there was more matzah. But as the Rebbe took one step away, he came back. He picked up a matzah and he broke it. And he gave me the broken piece. He looked at me in the eyes and he said, I got my broken matzah. I left. My father came right after me. He got one whole matzah. And then he got a second whole matzah for the Zeitung, for the newspaper. And he got a third, not whole matzah, but a, a, a piece of a broken matzah. He came out, the guy came over to him. This was the early 80s, Mustama, 80, 81. He said, $10,000 for the matzah. <laughs> guy comes over to him by the elevator, $10,000 for the matzah. <laughs> he didn't. <laughs> but uh, that was that. Good. I was very happy I got my broken matzah. I didn't think about it much. The story was, uh, I experienced it. At some point in my life, I started to contemplate what really was the Indian, the Rebbe, even though there were only whole matzahs, he didn't want to give me a whole matzah. And he didn't want to break the matzah, but he decided instead of going to get a new package, ultimately he broke the matzah. And I have to say, I can't say for sure, it's just speculation, but I saw when the Rebbe broke the matzah, it wasn't the most comfortable thing. He broke it. There was a certain hesitancy, even though he did it at the end. And I have to say, you know, again, as Chatoya and Imaskir Ayem, I was thinking to myself, Bashas Maisid, just, you don't have to break it. <laughs> I'll be the first kid who gets a whole matzah. Marash. <laughs> What's going to happen? I'll tell my mother I got a whole matzah. He didn't want. He wanted to give me a broken matzah. So I can't tell you the reason. I can't tell you the reason because I don't know the reason. Perhaps. It was a blessing in the Rebbe's own inimitable way that I should be able to find my second half. Machtes HaShekel. Machtes HaShekel. Right? The Rebbe said in the last Fabrengen, Vayakel, it was Parsha Shkolem, the last Fabrengen. So he said, why do you give a Machtes? You should give a whole Shekel. There's no other Indian in the Beis HaMikdash that you give Dafke incomplete. You're supposed to give complete. You're not supposed to give half. The answer is, because if you give the complete, you're not giving the complete because you're half. <laughs> the only way you could be completed is by somebody else. So if you're going to give whole, you're going to remain incomplete. The only way you could, the highest was tzuch. The only way you could be complete is if you give half. 
because somebody else will give your other half. So I think that was one thing. And for my, my, my personality, my life, it was a special blessing to be able to find my second half to complete me. Perhaps, however, there was also something deeper. And that is, it happens to be that in my journey of life, everybody has their journey, their shlichus. I encounter a lot of brokenness. I encounter a lot of brokenness. I hear people, I, I read people's letters, I meet people, and I see brokenness wherever I go. A lot of broken, broken hearts, broken marriages, broken souls, broken lives. Brokenness, pain, hearts that are shattered. They're shattered, they're broken. And it's not so easy. It's not so easy to encounter it. There's a lot of people are sensitive and people are deep and people carry a lot. If you go around this room, right, and you go beyond the smiles, every person has a story. And the story has usually a little brokenness in it and sometimes a lot of brokenness in it. And you know better than I do. And I feel, today I feel, that the Rebbe was telling me something and empowering me. And that is, don't be afraid of a broken matzah. Don't be afraid of brokenness. Not in yourself and not in other people. When you see brokenness, don't run away. Don't close your eyes. Don't numb it. Don't go eat uh, sushi or potato chips. Have the courage and the love to be able to stay there. And to be able to take the broken matzah, to embrace it, to hold on to it. To be there, to be present. And it's a challenge. It's a challenge within myself. And it's a challenge, I think, with each other. We're often used to living in a culture, in a system, or an environment where if you don't display perfection, if you display brokenness, it's like, what's going to happen? It's almost like struggle is evil. And if you're struggling with something, there's shame around it. But that's antithetical to the whole, to the whole of Judaism. <laughs> the whole of those of you who learned the Maimer, we finished the Maimer today, Basi Lagani Tavshin Chav Gimel. The Maimer of Basi Lagani have connected to this sweet year's Ois Yud Gimel. So the whole Nekuda of the Maimer, both, both Tavshin Chav Gimel, Tavshin Mem Gimel, is Eirein Soif, is Lamayla Adin Katz, it's so, an expression from Zoyer. What's Pshat Lomata Adin Tachlis? That the light of Hashem extends downward, 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 till no end. There's no place or person that's too low where he says, sorry, you're too low for me. What's Pshat Lomata? Lomata doesn't mean in your basement. Lomata means those places in our lives that feel so low, so detached, we become disassociated because of those places. Those places of absolute fragmentation and alienation. Over there, to the point that you can't even get lower. Don't be afraid of it. Don't be afraid. It's already safe over there. Hashem is there. There's, there's, there's infinity there. It has to be explored, it has to be found, it has to be discovered. <clears throat> Kotzker Rebbe once said, he said in Yiddish, Sinishta, what did he say? Sinishta aza krumezach via gleich vertel. Sinishta aza gleichezach via kruma later. Sinishta aza schwarzezach via weiße tachrichem. Und sinishta aza ganzezach via zerbrochene Herz. How do I translate? There's nothing as crooked as. 
the Agleich Vertel is a, a con artist smoothness. A, you deal with con artists ever in real estate or whatever? Huh? Slick, very good. Slick, sly, smooth, the gift of gab. There's nothing as crooked and perverted. There's nothing as, as straight as a slanted ladder because it gets you up. There's nothing as black as the white shrouds in which we dress a corpse. And he said, there's nothing as whole as a broken heart. al Rebbe says in Tehreir Tetzave, what's about a broken heart? Broken heart doesn't mean it's a mitzvah to break somebody's heart. A broken heart means you open up a door so that the light should come in. When the wall is blocking the sun, you have to open. It's not that you want to break the wall. You want to create an opening that the light to come. That's what a broken heart means. A broken heart is not a mitzvah to break a heart. It's the idea that there's no ego blocking the light. As somebody once said, when I was young, I worshipped perfection. Today, I only look for things that have cracks inside of them. Because that's what allows the light to come in. The light comes in when there's cracks. Yeah, we live in a time today where people need to be able to feel comfortable to talk about their cracks, <laughs> to talk about their broken matzah. We know the whole matzah. We know that. We know that everybody's perfect. We know that. We've been there. We know that your family is perfect and all the shatchanim are chasing you. It's going to be like that loyal and vod. But today we've graduated. We have to be comfortable to be able to speak about cracks. And that's where the light comes in. And if we can create, every one of us in your work and in your house, you create an environment, you create a, a space where people can feel love, they can feel trust, they can feel safety. And you'll only do it with other people if you do it with yourself. When your brokenness comes up, instead of killing yourself and knocking yourself down and telling yourself how evil you are, which is the regular way to do it, instead you can take it, you can, you can embrace it, and this is your yachatz, you know, this is your, your afikaiman. This is the Zeichel Karim Pesach. You can really embrace it. And you can make space for it. You can make space for it in other people. And when you make space for it in other people, you'll see their face changes. They become less tense. They let go. And when they let go, you could connect. Your children will be able to let go. The biggest Kiddush is your wife will be able to let go. I know you don't believe me. If you let go, he's laughing. I laughed. Try it. <laughs> okay, don't try it. <laughs> Maybe the hardest thing is for, for you to let go. It's hard because there's so many voices. There's so many voices of judgment. So since those are the last words I heard... So I want, to, I want to share that with you tonight, Yud Shvat. I want to bless myself and bless all of you and bless all of your loved ones. That we should be able to take those words from the Rebbe, but this is for your love. And to be able to give that to people, be able to give that to ourselves, to be able to really create a world, a home, an environment where people can bond, where people can connect soul to soul, body to body, with full trust. There's nothing, trust me, there's nothing that helps people in life like creating places of trust. That's really what a fabrengen is supposed to be. Rabbi Jonathan Sachs once said, what's the difference between all of shalom? What do you mean a fabrengen, a sermon, and a party? <laughs> Some shuls is no difference. But he said as follows. A party, you know, a party, a Lebedeke party. He said, everybody speaks and nobody listens. It's a party. By a sermon, one person speaks and nobody listens. Party, everybody speaks. A Fabrengen, he said, nobody speaks and everybody listens. <laughs> it was a profound idea. So I know that I'm speaking. <laughs> I shouldn't be speaking. It says in the Kutatayr, in Parshish Tzav, the al says, he says that, 
He says, they're learning Torah in Gan Eden for 3,000 years. What's Mashiach going to teach people that were in Gan Eden for 3,000 years? So the Alter Rebbe says, he's going to teach Re'iyah. Re'iyah de Chachma. There's not going to be words. He's going to show you. He brings a story from the Arizal. The Arizal once had a dremel. He snoozed off Shabbos afternoon. And he was talking in his sleep. When he woke up, Rabbi Chaim Vital asked the Arizal what was going on. So the Arizal says, if I speak for the next 80 years, I won't be able to tell you what I just saw. There was secrets in Parshas Bilam and Parshas Balak. The Rebbe says, what's Pshat? Pshat is, the more you see, the less you speak. The more you talk, the less you see. Look who's talking, but anyway. <laughs> right? I say that triple speed was created from my shiurim. Kal ma shabarak hadash baruch hu bai lamai. Lebrai ala lechvayda. Most people, you know, you give a shiur 30 minutes. 45 minutes is like, uh, whatever, like. And then there's some shagayim will give a shiur, you know, two hours, they still you have to tell them. Right? I once said from Dr. Metzke, he said there was a rav, he went on and on and on and on. And he finished finally the drasha. and somebody came over to him and said, Rebbe, you know, you don't speak so long. The whole shul was gone. Like the Kiddush club was complete. It, was, it took everybody in. So the rav says, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry, but there was no clock on the wall. He says, there was no clock on the wall, but there was a calendar on the wall. <laughs> so, uh, so that's why double speed and triple speed and quadruple speed and sectillion speed was created for certain people. The truth is, the closer we get to Geula, it's all going to be less words and more experiential. Most people grew up, people here grew up learning chsidus, but everything is words, 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 words. Nefesh alakis, nefesh abahamis, oilamis, neshamis, alakos, mamalis, soivav, lifnat simtsum, lachat simtsum, kav, neshimu, akudim, nekudim, brudim, Svidus, Kesa, Atik, Arech, yeah? Words. Now, Daloi words. Now we're coming to a time of Re'iya. Re'iya means experiential. When you experience something, it's not about words. Moshe was Kvat Pe, Kvat Loshen. Why? So the Rebbe says, the more you see, the less you speak. The more you speak, the less you see. Moshe soy words define it and articulate it and limit it. We need today less words. We need experience. How do you learn experience? It's not so easy to learn experience. Experience, words can be camouflaged within facades. Experience is either real or it's not real. Either you're experiencing or you're not experiencing. So there's words, 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 words. Words today are not filling the crowds. The crowds don't want words. The oil wants the ear. They want to see it. What does it mean see it? I can't see it with my eyes. I want to experience it in my nervous system. You want your nervous system, the goof, the goof, the goof should fail it to experience it. I can't give somebody the experience if I don't have the experience. The experience. To have the experience, we have to let go of so many fears and so many layers. Words are like big cover ups, they're cover ups. <laughs> I feel stupid talking about what I'm saying. But uh, that's what I do, so you'll forgive me. Yes, that's what it sounds like. That's what it sounds like. So many layers, yeah, so many layers. There's a Breslau of Avar, Jeb Nachman of Breslau once said, what's the difference giving a speech and singing a song? He said, when you give a speech, if somebody starts talking in the middle of your speech, it's called interruption. What if I'm singing a song and somebody starts singing in the middle of my singing? It's called harmony. So he said the objective of life is to stop speaking and start singing. Those who speak, everybody's always interrupting them. And those who sing, everybody's harmonizing with them. So he said in life, stop speaking, start singing. And by the way, try it in the house. When you come home late, the problem is you're talking. You come home late, don't talk, sing. If you talk, your spouse is going to interrupt you. If you sing, she'll harmonize with you. You come home late, you don't say, oh, I, there was traffic, whatever, I don't know the excuses, but uh, I meant, but there was a call, there was an emergency, whatever, yeah? And then it's right away, you know, here we go, the predictable argument. You come home. And you're like, I am so happy to be home. It is gewaldic to see you. 
What is she going to say? <laughs> you fill my heart with joy and with ecstasy. Good. You have a beautiful evening together. You could try it tonight when you come home, because the Kabbalah's Ponim is not going to be... Uh, unless she's watching, the Kabbalah's Ponim, but now Dafka going to be the best Kabbalah's Ponim. No words, just singing, just nigunim. Just nigunim. The ego doesn't like nigunim. The ego like... Ibchim istabra. You see, in a nigun, it's altsandersh. So that's what Ibn Nachman said. Aniya Kotin, I'm going to be mice of this. That there are people that even when they sing, they're still talking. <laughs> and there are people, even when they talk, they're singing. So I want to bless you all, my dear brothers and friends. We should stop talking and start singing. We should stop using words and open ourselves up to experience. You say in the morning, Avas Hashem Close your eyes, take a deep breath, and ask Hashem to allow you to experience the love. Avas Hashem To be able to experience it in your body, in your nerves, in your brain, in your heart. To be able to feel it. Mamish to feel it. What would it be to feel Avas Oilam Aftanu Hashem because if you could feel it, then your children will feel it from you. You know what that means? Think, did you, did, does anybody here in the room feel, do you know what it feels to be loved? Don't all raise your hand, mamash at the same moment, please. Does, do we know what it feels? Not, I know the words, I'm, I'm good with words. <laughs> I'm good with words, we know words. Do you know what it does your nervous system love? Does your goof know the goof weist the outs? Somebody wrote a book, Best of the Body Keeps the Score. So I showed Chayesod the Tavshin Yud Alev, the Rebbe said a Sicha. It's before your Chvat. He said, It says in Zoyar that Avram and Sora is the Nesham and the goof. Avram is the, goof, the body, is the soul. And, and Sada is the body. So the Rebbe asked, they say, what's Pshat? Whatever Sada says, you should listen. Whatever your goof says, you should listen. Weren't we taught that whatever your body says, you shouldn't listen? So the Rebbe said, that's, that's a paradigm of Golos. But the others, the Gemara says, the others lived in a paradigm of Geula. And in Geula, you listen to your body. Whatever the goof says, Shma Bekoila. You have to listen to the goof. This was 1950. 30 years later, they started to be Megala, everything about what the body has. The body knows everything. The nervous system, the body, somatic healing, and energy healing, and bodily healing, etc., you have to listen to the goof. So avas oilam aftonu means that the goof is fill in the body. Why? Because when the goof experiences, it's internalized, it's real. And then the keli opens up and you could feel the neshama. Yeah. The Rebbe used to say this a lot. Now, the goof gets chayas from the neshama. It says, after Mashiach comes, the neshama is going to be nourished from the goof. How? <laughs> the herst? Because the goof is, bono b'chart is in the goof. The p'chit is in the goof. That's what it says in Tanya, Perek Memtas. So the goof has something very special. Of course, if the goof, the goof can also take you downward. But the real goof is, is more divine in some ways than the neshama. It says in Tanya, Pedic Memtes, Ubono Bacharta, you know the Lashon. Hu ha guf ha chumri, ha nidme be chumri yusil a gufu yom asylum. Now the Rebbe says, Where was the Bechira? The Bechira wasn't in the Neshama, because the Neshama is lechatchila higher. The Neshama is different. You didn't have to choose the soul. If you're going to buy a house, 
the guy who's selling you the house in Pomona says, I have a house to sell you. I also have a car. I'm not interested in a car. I'm interested in a house. There's only one house. There's nothing to choose from. If there's two houses, you can choose. If the choice of Hashem was in the soul, the chelik mal, there's no competition. If you want the neshama, it's unique. So where was the pchira in the gulf? The hast? Ah. So when the pchira is nizgala in the gulf, the neshama is going to be makabel. The neshama is going to be makabel from the gulf. But my point here is not the words. My point is that this is for your love, right? You could feel it, you can experience it, that safety. So I want to use this opportunity to bless all of us and myself and all of us who are joining virtually, that we should be able to be people that give this gift to others and give this gift to ourselves. And the only way I can do it is if I become a channel, I open myself up to the divine Avas Oilam Aftanu Hashem Alekeinu. Aboi Chibami Yisrael Ba'ava. And not to be afraid of broken matzahs. Not to be afraid of broken people. Don't, don't look the other way. You don't have to close your eyes. Not in yourself and not in others. Take it and embrace it. And then we'll reveal that Eidin Saif is Lamata Adin Tachlis. Because everyone has the light. Everybody. You don't have to create people. You just have to let them find themselves. And the only way you could let them find yourself is if you, somehow we can do it for each other. We can't do it ourselves. We need each other. If I can create a space for you, you can create a space for me. What does this mean practically? So the practical exercise is, the next time somebody tells you something, right? We who grew up in yeshiva, we know that what's called a successful yeshiva bacher, you have a fast, feisty, and aggressive response. A guy came to me, he was having shalom bias issues. I said, it's not so complicated. Everything you were told that would make you excel in yeshiva is causing a disaster in your house. So in yeshiva, you knew that if the, the greatest way to become a chash of a bacha in his particular yeshiva was if you could find how the rosh yeshiva is wrong. He's giving a shir, and you could show him that he forgot a rambam. It's the best thing you can do for your shidduch, for your reputation, for your, for your success. If you could show that he didn't understand toismas, or he's contradicting another toismas, you're a winner. Nobel Prize. In the middle of the shir, like mamish, when he's at the punchline, and everybody is in awe, and you could say, you forgot a toysmus. You forgot the toysmus. Oh, gewaldic. Gewaldic, you're done. Now you get married, you think this is how, what you're supposed to do with your wife, right? <laughs> <laughs> so your wife tells you something, and she says it passionately, just like the Rosh Hashiva. And you're like, you don't know the Rambam. <laughs> the Rambam, Mamish says, fakert. There's also a Sikha fakert. There's also a Maimah fakert. And even yesterday's Ayoyim Yoyim is Mamash Fakert. And Toysfus is Mamash Fakert. And Shulchan Aruch, Mibchlau Mamash Amiratsus. Now you're waiting for her to say, wow. I knew I married a genius. I am such a lucky woman. I can't thank God enough for bringing us together. <laughs> and somehow the response that you got in Yeshiva <laughs> is not working out. <laughs> So I explained to this Bachar <laughs> that you got to change the paradigm a little bit. When somebody tells something that trigger, says you that triggers you, don't jump. Be curious. Listen to what just happened inside of you. Listen to your broken matzah. <laughs> Explore it. Bring it out. Talk about it respectfully. And if you're two partners who can talk to each other on that level about the broken matzahs, you'll be able to heal each other in a very powerful way. Your child says something to you, you're triggered, you want to jump, you want to prove him wrong, you want to convince him how wrong he is, or convince her how wrong he is, she is. But usually, in most cases, it's counterproductive. You'll go to a much deeper place if you could be aware of what's happening inside of you 
when they say those words to you. And then you could make a choice from which place to respond from. From a place of instinctive triggers where you're overwhelmed, angry, frightened, which is usually a part of you that is wounded or a part of me that's wounded. Or to respond from a place of, of deep connection. In the Lashon of Tanya, to respond from Yenefer Shachiyunis or from Yenefer Shalikis, from Yenefer Shabamas or Yenefer Shalikis. The language of neuroscience, to respond from your reptilian brain or to respond from your prefrontal cortex. You could respond from both. One is a survival mechanism. It's like there's a fire alarm. <laughs> or to respond from a place of wholeness, of elokus, of ein soif. And then it's a different response. It's hard because there's a struggle. And you have to believe that ein in soif lamata din tachlas. So this is, this is, you learn chesidus, not with words, but with experience. Let it touch you. Open yourself up to it. It could be even five minutes, but those five minutes should be authentic. Real, pnimiyizdik. Then I show up to life from a different place. Instead of showing up from a place of fear and control, you show up from a place of love and acceptance and trust. And instead of pouncing on you, I can embrace, and I could connect. And that's where miracles happen. Like the Mittler Rebbe said, when two Jews speak in Inyane Avoida, two people sit down and they speak about real things, Mittler Rebbe said, it's Svei Nefesh Alekis, Afei Nefesh Bahamas. It's two godly souls ganging up, so to speak, against one animal soul. Not ganging up, but it's two animal souls. So I once heard that Rebbe said it over at Fabreng, and he said it doesn't, uh, mathematically, it's not the case. It's two divine souls against two animal souls. Why did the middle of Rebbe say it's two against one? It's not two against one, it's two against two. So the Rebbe said, does it. The Nefesh Alekis, by definition, is interested in the other person's Nefesh Alekis. Because the godly part of you is one. It's one with the world, it's one with everything, it's one with Hashem. Hashem is oneness. So my nefesh alakis is in love with your nefesh alakis. We're connected. My nefesh Bahamas is my reptilian brain. An alligator is interested in an alligator and not in anything else. Churchill said appeasement is feeding the alligator in the hope that he's going to eat you last. That's what appeasement looks like. That's Israel with Oslo and how they deal with terrorist attacks. Appeasement, you feed the alligator or the crocodile and you hope he'll eat you last. After he finishes the Leviathan and the Sher Habar and everything else, you're going to be the last one. But till then, you're going to be there to enjoy the meal. A lizard, a reptile, is, it knows about a lizard. That's it it knows about. <laughs> a lizard doesn't have a vision of cosmic oneness, of Diri You can't expect that. When I'm in my lizard brain, all I'm thinking about is survival. Whatever that looks like. Survival. Fight, flight, freeze, fawn, whatever it is. Narcissism, other things. I'm just busy surviving. I can't really connect to you. I don't have that ability. I'm too defensive. Too defensive. Right? And by the way, when your kids start getting older, they're going to start telling you things about your parenting. That's the say today. <laughs> it used to be in the Sarah it was Kabed Simecha. They changed it to Kabed Es Bitcha. <laughs> I don't know who changed it, but somebody changed the text recently. I was in shul by me, so somebody says, Rabbi Why? Why? He's a kid, a teenager. He's a Rabbi, Rabbi Why? You think it's easy raising parents today? I said, No, it's very hard. It's very, very hard. I know, I'm dealing with it. <laughs> very hard to raise, but mechanach your parents is not so simple. <laughs> you got to teach them so many new stuff. <laughs> There was a, uh, was a guy who was a smart man, Mark Twain. He once said, when I was nine, my father was a genius. When I was 19, he was an idiot. Now I'm 29, I have a bunch of kids, and he has some smart things to say. It's funny how much the old man learned in 10 years. <laughs> yeah. I said, now long ago, I said, what's the story of the Afikaiman? 
Yeah, you hide the matzah very, very well under the couch. Yeah, nine pillows. Somehow one of your kids finds it, and then he wants his prize, yeah? In my days, it used to be, if you were a schnutter, you got potato chips. If you were a Rockefeller, you got a calculator. Calculator. If you were a musk, you got a Parker pen. Today, you give your son a calculator for the Afrikaim, and he'll call child services on you for abuse. It's a private yacht, a private jet, a Lamborghini. If your mom is a schnutter, a tablet. But if it's anything less than that, you're the most abusive person in the world, yeah? Your father ever came to your siddha party? Today, if you don't come to your siddha party, your wife is going to send you a shiva madura gehenna. But in any case, how do we get into this? Ah, so, dafi koiman, yeah. So I told him like this, it works like this. We hide stuff, yeah? Whatever we hide, <laughs> our children expose. <laughs> That's the story of dafi koiman. A lot of things were hidden for many, many years. That's the system. The children today are bringing everything out. At some point when they get a little older, they start sharing with you what they think about you as parents. When they're four years old, they don't. When they're 14, depends what type of kid you have. I know some of you have 14-year-olds going on 99. But at some point, they're going to say, Ma, ta, you were really clueless, you know that, yeah? You're going to hear stuff, and it's not going to be easy. Now, the MS is, you mamash had Mercedes Nefesh. They know what it was to pay tuition. Your kids know what it is to pay tuition and cover a mortgage and just buy regular dinner and Shabbos. They don't know. So the natural instinct is to become defensive and tell them you're ungrateful, you're narcissistic, you're selfish, spoiled brats like all your classmates. Right? And if you're sophisticated, you explain to them. We did the best we can, and you should be thankful, and we're not perfect. And you're very proud of yourself. The MS is you just reacted from your Nefesh Bahamas, the Hainu, your reptilian brain. In Tanya, there's, three, there's four souls. Nefesh HaChiyunas, Nefesh Bahamas, Nefesh HaSichlis, Nefesh HaLikis. When the Altarebbe wrote it in the 1700s, you had to believe in Bermuna. The Altarebbe knew what he's talking about. 1980s, they started to give us scans from the brain. You take a look at scans and you see Tanya in the scans. Nefesh Achiyunis, amygdala, reptilian brain, the lizard, the crocodile, the alligator. If you're a nice guy, it's a lizard. If you're you, you're an alligator. But it's a rept, you're a reptile. Nefesh Achiyunis. Nefesh Bahamas is the limbic brain. The elephant, chimpanzee, monkey, some of you are mouse, rats, whatever, you'll ask your mother-in-law. But whatever it is, the limbic brain, emotional memory, you're an elephant. Elephants remember everything and they're emotional. You're a puppy, you're a dog. No, no, in a very powerful way. It says in Kabbalah, Kelev, Kuloi Lev, Kelev, Kulo. It's very emotional. Elephants, Kevaldic, memories, connections, they remember everything. Deep connections, but it's the limbic brain, Nefesh Bahamas. Nefesh HaSichlis, prefrontal, prefrontal cortex, prefrontal lobes. One is the stem of the brain. You go higher. It's more evolved, more developed. And then the prefrontal only develops the Gemara says in Kedushan when you're 24. Executive functioning, long-term thinking, delaying gratification, morality, pros versus cons, bigger picture. It's, it's a whole different thing. Nefesh HaSichlis. Then you have the Nefesh HaLikis. Nefesh HaLikis won't show up on CAT scans because they still didn't figure out how to take a picture of God. <laughs> Godliness you don't take a picture of. But the Nefesh HaLikis... The Nefesh HaLikis is Kulei Ein Saif. It's pure infinity. Kulei Bittl, Kulei Ein Saif. It's full of oneness. Over there, there's Bechlal. It's a place of pure transcendence. Every moment, you have to ask yourself, which brain are you responding from? Your teenage girl tells you something. Before you respond, ask yourself, is this going to be a Nefesh HaKiyonis response? A Nefesh Bahamas response? A Nefesh HaSichlis response? You're capable of a nefesh alikis response. Take a deep breath. Go into your chelik alikami mal mamish. Ask your nefesh alikis, what does my girl need to hear? And that's how you respond. Does it mean you don't have a nefesh? You have a nefesh alikis, is vos. The crocodile is a crocodile. The dog is a dog. They're all cute little puppies and animals. It's not nishkeferlich. Especially a lizard, a salamandra, a frog. A cockroach, a spider, whatever your reptile looks like. I don't want to mix into politics. You'll ask your therapist. 
אדם כיעקב מכם, מן הבהמה, מן הבוקר, מן הצוין, יו השוי נגח, יו הכסף, יו הנאיז, יו הטר, יו הבן יוינה, whatever it is. Yeah, it could be all, all together sometimes. So שוי נגח, what's last one? Which one resonated? Ah, there was a Yid in Yerushalayim, it was a Magid, his name was Reb Sholem Mordechai Shvadron. You remember Rav Shvadron? He was a very, he was a funny man. He was the inical of the Maharsham, the Berzhan Erov, the Berzhan Erov. So, so he was a very, he was a very, he was a colorful personality. So he used to tell stories with a Yerushalmi song, with a Yerushalmi sing song. So he once said that a Bacha came to him, the Pshal Mordechai Shvadron. They called him the Yerushalayim a Magad, Yerushalayim a preacher. The Bacha told him that he's very upset. Why is he upset? Because he wishes Hashem would have made him like a behemoth. He watches cows and horses, and he sees, number one, they don't have to go to the bathroom. Wherever they need to do what they have to do, they can do it. Number one. Number two, there's no shachris min chemaidath. There's no tefillin. There's no brachas. There's no tzitzis. Yeah? In this crowd, you can say there's no chitas. There's no rambam. Yeah? Not even dafayoymi. Garnished. Not yirashalmi, not bavli. Another, they also, he says, you know, they don't have to eat with a fork, with a knife, with a spoon, with a plate. They don't have to get dressed in the morning. He says, me, I get dressed, and there's a bathroom with a shachris, with a tefillin, with brushing teeth, with plates, with forks, with knives. And Ibn Shalomar, the Cheshmerdun says, the boy starts crying. And he says in Yiddish, he said with a nigan, he says, God Almighty, why didn't you create me as a mammal, as an animal? So the Pshalom Mordechai, I have to say it in Yiddish. And then I'll translate it. He said, And he's sobbing and asking God why he wasn't created as a behemoth. And I tell him, You have no reason to weep. You're exactly, exactly what you wanted to be. That's what you are. Okay, so he was saying it, you know, in his, in his drushes. But on a more authentic level, yeah, you learn Tanya, you learn Chassidus, you have to be able to identify which part of you is taking over now. And you don't have to repress the other part and, and make believe it doesn't exist. The whole Chiddush of the Alter Rebbe and Tanya is that the Benini can deal with different voices simultaneously. It's beautiful. You don't have to be ashamed. You don't have to amputate. You don't have to make believe you're something you're not. You have to bring in all parts into the relationship. That's Sefer Shal Benenim. It's a whole different Indian. The Maim Abbasi Lagani, we learned about Shem Tev says, Tachtiyim Shniyim Ushlishim. There's three levels to the Teva. So the Baal Shem Tev says, in every word, in every Teva, in every word, there's Oilamis, there's Neshamis, and there's elokus. In every word, there's different layers. There's the perspective of the world, the perspective of the soul, the perspective of pure Ein Saif. Oilam is Neshama Salakus. You always have to see in every word the three layers and bring them together. Connect them. In our life, what it means in a very simple, practical level, at least in this context, is your child says something to you it was a big, uh, it was, um, there was a Jew, he was an Auschwitz survivor. The Rebbe held very much from his shit in psychology. His name was Viktor Frankl. So he used to say that when you have stimuli, when somebody says something, stimuli, be between stimuli and reaction, between stimuli and response, there's a tiny little space. And in that space, that's where human freedom and growth exists. So you said something to me, uh, right? Between what you said and my response, there's a tiny space. If you hold on to that space, that's where you have khira. That's where you become a person. If you delete that space, I become an alligator <laughs> or an elephant, which sometimes you're cute. Elephants are cute, let's face it. I happen to have an affinity for animals. I also like my nefesh of Ahamas, Ms. Malazman. 
But animals are very special. Toy the Alter Rebbe's Vartan Tanya is you don't destroy your Nefesh Bahamas. You open it up, you enlighten it, you educate it, you talk to it, you have to have a conversation with it. You don't destroy parts, you don't destroy broken matzahs, you talk to them. So when we're in relationships and something comes our way, it could be an arrow, and you take it as an arrow, and then you shoot a bullet. You shot an arrow, I'll shoot a bullet. But that means I'm in a place of war. I'm in a place of fear, and some of us are. Especially if in your childhood you had to defend yourself so much, you don't even know, you're always in a place of war. Whatever your wife says, it's a declaration of war. It's almost like 1939, Britain and Germany. Declaration of war. She said, could you go get wine for Shabbos? Declaration of war. You forgot to bring challah, war. Why are you late, war. Mamash, a declaration of war. It's Mamash Melchemet Olam Ashlishit. Third World War. Those of you who don't understand what I'm talking about, Ashrechem, you can leave. You can leave. Those of you who do understand what I'm talking about, <laughs> don't leave. <laughs> Stay. <laughs> And if you're feeling that, it has nothing to do with the other person. When the Baal Shem Tev said, every person is a mirror, the Baal Shem Tev understood this better than everybody. If that's what you're feeling, it has very little to do with the other person. It doesn't mean the other person is perfect. But I have to be able to really see why is it war? Why? What? 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 And you know what? You begin a journey of birth, of discovery. It's, it's humbling, but it's very, very meaningful. And we live today in a generation where people don't want to be robotic Jews, they want to be enthusiastic Jews. It's a generation before Gaula, people want authenticity, pnimius. So sein durch gearbeit. Not superficial. For it not to be superficial, I have to be able to be aware of what's happening. So that's our blessing tonight, one of our blessings. The Derebbe's words, this is for your love, should be able to be internalized in all of us. We should be able to give that to people, to give that to ourselves. We should be able to hold on to the broken matzahs in ourselves and in others. And we should be able to respond in a way that brings real connection. Because there's no joy like the joy of connection, like the joy of oneness, like the joy of achtos. There's nothing like it. We learned today in the Maimon that when Yaakov died, when Yaakov passed away, it says it was ovel covered le Mitzrayim. So Machzedek says it wasn't an ovel for Mitzrayim, it was an ovel for Yaakov's family. So Machzedek says the worst people who suffered from Yaakov's passing was the Mitzrayim. Because they became, Pare lost touch with Kedusha. And he became Leah Eidi. Because when Yaakov was alive, he knew the Nilus was coming up every day because of Yaakov's bracha. Once Yaakov passed away, he can detach from himself. It was the worst moment for Mitzrayim when the one who suffers most from Klippa is Klippa. Because really it's ain't Saif. Lamata Adin Tachlas. When you have to be who you're not, it's too painful. Whenever we have to be confrontational, divisive, in other words, we're in war. The worst victims of that are not just our families, them too, but also you yourself. That's why you have no menuchas anafesh. That's why this one is binging, and this one is on the screen all day, and this one is texting while I'm talking, and this one is watching clips, my clips or other clips. If you're watching my clips, it's Nishka Ferlich. If you're watching Netflix, it's Ananda Inyan. But you don't have to do it, Mamish, in front of me. Just joking. But the Nakuda is, we're busy numbing. Why are we busy numbing? Because it's hard, life is hard. I want to bless you that when you go home at night, <laughs> when you go home at night, before you, before you open the door, you should say, ah, thank you Hashem, that I can come home to such a house. I know some people come to a house and before they open the door, their heart is filled with butterflies. Maybe there's a fabrengen tonight. Let me find out, maybe there's a fabrengen, maybe there's a shear, no, no shear? Maybe there's a shear. Right? But before you come home, the office should be the place where you have to be to make parnosa. 
You come out of the car, you're already your heart swelling from 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 the simcha. Ah. For this, you have to be able to work on it. It's not so simple. But to reach that place of trust, of, of oneness. And then when you come in, it's a whole different energy. It's, it's, it's a different ambiance. There was a Yid who worked in the Rebbe's house. His name was Reb Sholemberg Gansberg. Shavar Rufur Shlem. I was once in cult of 12 o'clock midnight buying pampers. My wife sent me out to buy pampers. Who do I meet? Reb Sholemberg Gansberg. So I thought midnight you can get up. It's a good story, you know? So I said, it's Selmer Epis. So I asked him, I asked him, I said, when the Rebbe wanted to call his wife in the house, what did he call her? Like if the Rebbe was sitting on the couch and he wanted a cup of tea or he wanted to speak to her, what did he say? Did he say, Musya, Chaya Mushk? Like what did he say? How did he call her? I just asked. He said, I don't know. So I said, come on, you were there for 40 years. 40 years. He looks at me, he says, he said, Vitzchak, the Rebbe came on Nishgiruf and the vibe to come and Sam. <laughs> he never once called his wife to come over to him. If he wanted to tell her something, he stood up and went over to her. So he never heard the Rebbe calling her name. <laughs> I said, 40 years? He never sat on the couch. A cup of tea. Came on He went over and he asked what he wanted to ask. He never, so he doesn't know what he called her. <laughs> She would have been happy to make him a cup of tea. Huh? They had, but he told me, I don't know. I said, I'm not lying to you. I Pasha never heard him call her because if he wanted something, he went over to her. So he didn't have to call her. He said, it was once your Dalit Kislev. It was their anniversary. So, uh, so, uh, the Rebbe came home the Rebbe would always greet the Rebbe, even if it was very late, you know, three, four, five of them, she always stayed up for him, after Yechidus. So he said it was Yedalit Kisav, the Rebbe came home, and she was in the hall, he walked into the house, and he saw her, and he picked up his hands, and he said, Mazel Tov, Haint is dach unze yamtif. today is our yamtif. Then he saw that there was somebody in the house there, and he was quiet, because it was like an intimate, intimate moment. Zalman Garari called Yudalat Kistler, Zalman Garari, and the Rebbe usually wouldn't pick up the phone in the house. Usually somebody working there would pick up the phone. But it happened to be that Zalman Garari called, the Rebbe picked up the phone. So he didn't realize, so he thought it was one of the Mishamshim. So he said, Can I speak with the Rebbe? So the Rebbe, he didn't realize. So the Rebbe says, What do you need? Can you leave a message? I guess she was busy. He says, for the wedding, I wanted to wish a mazel tov. The Rebbe said, <laughs> I'm also part of it. Then he realized that it wasn't the Gansberg or Nautic or whoever worked over there. He says, Mikhen Stoichvinsch and Mazel tov. Tried to bring out, uh, I don't know if he hung up, Zama <laughs> but, uh, but uh, that I don't know. I heard this, I think, from his daughter, from his son. What I'm bringing out is, it's a very special thing if you could come home and walk in, right? Your heart opens, your heart is unze yamtif. Even not on your anniversary. For this, we have to do avoida. What's that avoida? Avoida doesn't mean avoida, you know, you drill a hole in your heart. Avoida means that you become aware of what's the nefesh of Bahamas, what's the nefesh of Yunis, what's the nefesh of Sichlis, what's the nefesh of Likis. And then you choose to connect from a place of trust. And love and oneness. L'chaim, 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 l'chaim.
Yeah, good. Just continue it later. Go back. No. They said I need the space.
at Kana Coffee Base.
Special Ace Rutz and I want to sing a special nigan for all of our children. Everyone who's here for Gashmias and everyone who's joining us for all of our children. Habain Yakeli. You know Habain Yakeli, Ephraim? Yakeli. Yeah. 
חי אני, חי אני. The nigan is the oil, and the, 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 the talk, the words are the kelim. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oil is the kelim. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh? We have the oil, and we have the and the kelim. Oilamus is Oidis without Kalim. Shamas or Kalim, Kalim of Atsilus. And Oilamus is Pirud. What do you need more? What do you have a better map of reality? Huh? Oilamus, the Shamas, and the Kus. What's the most amount? Tachtiim, Shniim, or Shlisha. The Baal Shem Tov says in every word you have to see Eilamus, Neshamus, and Alakus. If not, don't finish the word. You didn't finish the word. Don't go to the next word. 
<laughs> That's why davening took a long time by the Baal If you don't go to the next word, you didn't see all of them. All three? All three. Mm-hmm. And then you have to connect them. <laughs> First you have to see all three, then you have to connect them. There was once a Maim, Lecha, Malibi, Gimel, the Slich, Estav, Shem, Chav, that ever did it in that Pasuk. He explained the Pasuk according to Eilamas, and then Eshamas, and then Alakus. Lecha, Malibi, Bak, Shufana, Espanach, Hashem, Avakish. L'chaim, l'chaim, no more l'chaim. And this was his answer, the Val Shantov's answer to his anxiety about the Mashiach. I mean, only yeah. when it's Yehudah. That was the anxiety, yeah, not anxiety. No, that yeah. was the answer to his anxiety. Yeah, yeah, I said it in the Shia. Well, Shantov writes in a letter to his brother-in-law, to Bresh and Kittiver, I said in the Shia, that when he, Bresh Hashanah, Tafuk of Zion, he had Aliyah's on his Shammah. That's when he met Mashiach and he asked him, when are you coming? He said, That's when the Baal Shem Tev revealed in the letter that they told him that every word is Olamis, Nashamis, Alakus, and you have to bring it together. Boyala Teva, Teva means word, Tachtiyim, Shniyim, Shlish. So whenever you have a conversation with anybody, you have to stop and say, Are we talking Olamis? Are we talking Hashamas? Are we talking Alakus? Which one? Are we on the lower no, part of the table? You have to ask yourself, are you the Eilam and the Shama or are you Alakus? They're all three. No, you. The question is, what frequency is the conversation happening on? If it's no. happening in Eilam, it's one in Tachdiyim, that's where the garbage was. <laughs> Shamas, the second level, that's where the animals were. And uh, the third level is where Noyach was. <laughs> but all three have to come together. The Baal Shem have to bring them together. So, uh, Eilamis, Neshamis, Alakus. There's Fabrengen also, there's Eilamis, there's Neshamis, and there's Alakus. What's my thought? That means when you look at me, or when I look at you, I could see Eilamis, I could see Neshamis, and I could see Alakus. Depends which yeah. which prescription of glasses you're wearing. Him, him specific or him? Not him, him also. Everyone. Uh Of course, they all have to join, but you have to know which frequency you're on. Tsoyar. The Bhagavad says Tsoyar Tasala Teva. You have to open up light into the word. Word. Tsoyar. Tsoyar means light. You have to open up light into the Teva. How do you open up light? So he said, when you bring together, when you align, Eilam is the Shamas and Lukas. That's the theme of Basilagani, Tav Shachav Gimel, this is what it is. Everybody knows that The, or not everybody knows, but the story behind the Basi Lagani, the Maimah Basi Lagani is that the, the Balai Lula, the Frida Kareba, the Rebbe Nayats, the last years of his life, it was hard for him to speak. So instead of speak, saying my Marim, he would give them out in writing in Ksav, and they would publish it, and the Ulam would learn it. For, for, for the different Yom HaDepagra, for the Yom HaMtayvim, for the holidays. Tov Shin Yud, 1950. Yud Shvat is the yard set of his grandmother. Rebbe Tzinifka, the wife of the Rebbe Marash. Her yard site is Yud Shvat. His mother's yard site was Yud Gimel Shvat, is Yud Gimel Shvat, Rebbe Tzinifka Sara. She's buried right near the oil. She passed away, Tov Shin Bez, the wife of the Rebbe Rashab. So, uh, so for the yard site of his grandmother, the Rebbe Rayans gave her a mimer. Which mimer was it? It was a mimer on the words Basi Lagani Achaisi Kala. The mimer had 20 chapters, has 20 chapters. So he gave out the first five chapters to be published for Shabbos Yudshvat, Tavshin Yud. Yudshvat was Shabbos. The second five chapters for Yud Gimel Shvat, the yard site of his mother. 
the third five chapters for Purim, and the last five chapters for Beis Nissen, the yard side of his father. So my of 20 prokim. Started off with the Pasuk Basi Lagani and Chesikala, which is from Shirashir and Pedeke. Good Shvat then was Shabbos Parsha's boy. I once saw the original Kuntras that was published in 1950. It said Shlita, the Shlita was missing a Yud. It's interesting, the Shlita, the Friedrich Rebbe's name was, Chakad Mur Shlita was missing a Yud. Huh? In that Kuntras. And we gave it out to learn for Shabbos. And that Shabbos morning, 10 to 8 in the morning, was the Histalkus. On the second floor of 770, it was the Histalkus. Yud Shema Tov Shin Yud Shabbos Boy. So the Rebbe gave out, uh, my mother already he gave out for Purim, for Yud Gimel, he gave out the next one, and Purim and Beis Nissen, until the Maimah was complete. It was already after the Histalkus. The next year, Yud Shvat, by the Fabreng and Tavshin Yud Aleph, when the Rebbe was Makabal the Nasiyas, so he never said, the way they knew that he was Makabal officially the Nasiyas to become a Rebbe was by saying a Maimer. And he said, the Maimer Basi Lagani, that the uh, Rebbe Rayads gave out the year before, and he started off, you can hear it on the tape, the Maimer of the Rebbe Terezi Yemen for the Yemen's Talkers, Basi Lagani Achesi Kala, and he said the Maimer. And every year he would say the same Maimer, but he would focus on a different chapter of the 20 chapters. Right? So Tavshin Yud Aleph was Ois Aleph, Tavshin Yud Beis was Ois Beis. Right? Tavshin Chav Gimel was Ois Yud Gimel. Tavshin Lamed, he finished. Ois Chav. Tavshin Lamed Aleph, the Rebbe started again. Ois Aleph. Second time. The Rebbe never finished the second time because Tavshin Mamches, after the Rebbe passed away, a few months later the Rebbe stopped saying my mother. The last Maimer was in the summer, Chukas Tavshin Mamches. After that, he didn't say Mamora. There were two exceptions, out of Pesach, out of Shavuos, but generally he stopped. So the last Maimer he said was, for Yud Shvat, was Tavshin Mamches, 1988. So it was Ois Yud Ches. But he never finished Ois Yud Tes and Ois Chav. That was never finished the second series. He stopped. After Tavshin Mamches, there were very few Maimora. For whatever reason, the Rebbe stopped saying Maimora. He also stopped Fabreng in the middle of the week. So this year is Ois Yud Gimel in the series, the fourth time. It's it's Tavshin Pei Gimel is Yud Gimel. That's why this year they learned Chav Gimel and Mem Gimel because those were the two times. But it was once of Abreng in Yud Shvat, actually the year that some of us were born, Tavshin Lamed Bey, 1972. And uh, the Rebbe then started over the Fabreng and, and he said something very, very powerful, very meaningful. He said that essentially the Friedrich Rebbe, his father-in-law, was giving out a Maimer for the day of his own Estalkos. He gave it out for the yard set of his Baba, of Rebbe Tzernifke, but Lepoil, it was fascinating because he gave a Maimer to learn for that Shabbos, which was the Yom Estalkos. That's why it became the Maimer Basi Lagani that's learned every year. So he said, so obviously something in this Maimer has his last message, like a tzavo like a final, what you call a final will and testament, this Maimer has the, the message that he wanted to leave the world with before his Estalkas. So the Rebbe said then that the opening of the Maimer is Basi Legane Achaisikala. So the Medrash says, Legan loy nemar, ela legani, lignuni, lamakim shayyikri betchila dekeshchina betachtay namaisa. That's how the Maimer begins. The Basi Legani doesn't say, I came to the garden. So I came to my garden. In other words, I came to my own place. I came back. I didn't come to the house. I came to my house. I came to my bossy legani. That's the pasuk in Shirashir. I came legani to my garden. Lignuni. This was my gununi is a chuppah that they would make for a chasan and kala pavilion. They would live there during Sheva brachas. It says, I came back to the place where I used to be, where my presence was present. He goes through the whole Indian with the seven, uh, the seven things that caused the Shechina to depart, and then the seven Sadikim who brought it back, and Moshe was the seventh. So the Rebbe said, why was this, the, 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 the Maimer, that the Rebbe Ayatz, Bahashkocha, gave over to the world, to the Chesidim, the Shabbos of his Estalkas? And the Rebbe explained as follows. I'm just going to say one point. If you look at the surface of the Friedrich Rebbe's life, he lived through the darkest point of Jewish history. 
He became a Rebbe in 1920. If you know what was happening in 1920, in 1917 was the Bolshevik Revolution. The Bolsheviks overthrew the Tsar, Nicholas II, the Romanov family. Later they found that they executed him and his wife and all of his children. It was a, it was a pretty, uh, pretty bloody story. And the Bolsheviks took over. And then there was a civil war for a few years until the, the commies won. And Lenin took over the country. It was Lenin and Stalin and Trotsky. And then when Lenin died in 1924, Stalin took over and his reign of terror lasted for 30 years till March 1953. Put him Tovshin Yud Gimel. Hurrah, hurrah. And uh, then Khrushchev took over. Today we have Putin. Huh? Zelensky, you mean. <laughs> so... Uh, the Rebbe Rayat, the Rebbe Rasha passed away in 1920 in Rostov, as I mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. So when the Rebbe, the Rebbe Rayat took over the Nasiyas, it was one of the darkest periods. Stalin would go on to murder 40, 50 million people over the next years. The darkness was, was incomprehensible, what was going on in Russia. Most people don't know because the Holocaust was so dark, it eclipsed the story of Russian Jewry. But the story of Soviet Jewry is an untold story. Most people don't know what happened though during those years. You know, it says, Every power in holiness has a power in unholiness. They balance out each other, so there should be choice. So if you want to understand the Gdusha, understand the holiness, the greatness of the Rebbe Rayat, of the Bala Lula, you have to ask one thing. Who was his little mother? Who was, uh, who was on the other side? And the answer is Stalin. <laughs> now Stalin, I'm laughing. Stalin was probably the greatest or one of the greatest murderers in history. His darkness, it's on, and the Fridi Kerebbe, the Rebbe was his, his little mother. So it gives you a little appreciation. Stalin killed more people than Hitler, just to put it in perspective. Kulay Sog Yachtov, the Rebbe's father before his said, Kulay Sog, Sog, Stalin and Hitler, and Hitler and the Russian Gimel and Hay are interchangeable. Kulay Sog Yachtov, it's all dirt and filth. He said, Tavshin Dalit, Stalin and Hitler. But he killed more people than uh, the Tzerer HaYehudim from Germany, if I'm not mistaken. Ah? Uh -huh. Kulay sog yachtov, ene se toiv gam echad, the tehillim, thus is main sog from Russian sigim, schmutz, psoilus, filth, dirt. The Rebbe's tata gesagt in Kazakhstan, Tavshindal, before his ptiri, he said, sog is Stalin on Gitler. He said it even in the Dnepr. And the Dnepr Petrovsky was already Tafresh Sadik Tess, he left there, so. I'm not going to argue with a historian. Okay. And he went to prison, Taka. Yeah. <laughs> so it was one of the darkest periods of history. And the Rebbe Ayats remained the Kabarnit. He remained the captain of the ship until he left Russia. He took Achrayas for the millions and millions, and most of Jews lived in Russia at the time, and he t exclusively took exclusive responsibility for it. Other people, either they became, either they escaped the country, even G'day Yisrael, or they maintained a low profile. And many people criticized him. They said, uh, it's a worthless battle. Finally, he left, and he came to Poland. And a few years later, it was the Second World War in 1939, and he barely escaped from Hitler's occupied Warsaw. And he came to America. In America, he had powerful assimilation. And he had to start all over again, literally from scratch, in a whole different angle, because America, the challenge was the exact opposite of Russia and Poland. No, now comes Tov Shin Yud. The Rebbe is about to leave the world. What would you expect his last message to be? Baruch Shepatrani. <laughs> Baruch Shepatrani. This is a sick place. This is an insane world. It's truly dark. The amount of death that he saw 
I heard from Chaim Baruch Halbush Tommy told me that he heard from Rabbi Tzimachal Medina that Rabbi Ayatz's wife, that she told him, she told this to him directly, he told this to me, that she once went into her husband after Yechidus. He would, it was Yechidus, and she went into him afterwards. And he was sobbing like, like, a, like a baby, he was sobbing, sobbing. And she got scared, her husband was pushing, sobbing, unstoppable. And he looked at his wife, it was hard for her to hear, she had a, so I, I, I don't know if he, you know, she read his lips or whatever, but he said, she said this over the Chaim Baruch, he looked at her, he said, it was after Yechidah, so he heard a lot of people, they came to him, he said, from the Yiddish of Falk. It's impossible, it's so hard to bear the, the challenges, the distress, the tzadahs of the Jewish people. You're talking about the darkest period of Jewish history. Between Stalin and Hitler, it was the greatest churban, I don't know, probably ever. It was always the churban by Yesheni, it was a crazy churban. Then you had the Crusades, you had the Spanish expulsion, you had the Chmelanetsky pogroms were horrific. Tach v'tat is Chmelanetsky, Bogdan Chmelanetsky. Tach v'tat, Ukraine, Slava Ukraina, Chmelanetsky, Kiev. But uh, but nothing compared to the Holocaust. It was like Lagabi, uh, the Holocaust, the six million. It was like, and and the Rebbe Yatzit is durchgelappt. And this is after Russia, what we went through. So you would think, and he was also physically sick. It wasn't like he was physically, you know, you see the, he was paralyzed, half of his body was paralyzed. He couldn't speak. So you would think that Rebbe said his last message was that Rebbe said, Allah Shandan in the Fabrengen, he quoted Yirmi Hanavi. Yirmi Hanavi writes in Eichel, Ani hagever ra ani. I saw the pain. Yirmi Hanavi didn't read about it in a newspaper or a WhatsApp or a diary. Yirmi saw Ani hagever ra ani in Eichel. I saw it all. I saw it happen. I saw it went up in flames. The Rebbe Rayatz was Ani Hagevera Ani. He saw it. He saw everything get destroyed. And not just in the general community, in his own family and among his own people, besides everybody else. So, Lechayru, you would think that the last message would be you know what? <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> I'm out of here. <laughs> Hopefully, there's some sweetness in the other world. <laughs> have a good, you know, have a good day. What was the last mimer? The last mimer was Bossi Legani Achaisikala. What's Bossi Legani Achaisikala? Hashem says that this world is my garden. And the definition of a garden is not like a field. A field is where you grow grain, which is necessary for living. It's a vital, it has vital nutrients for life bread, grain. But a gan, the idea of a garden is it's a place of pleasure. You go to a garden, there's a tremendous fragrance and beautiful aroma. And you take a spatzir, you take a tiyul, and you enjoy the flowers. It's not a necessity in terms of you have to, like oxygen or food. It's a place of pleasure, it's a place of delight. So Hashem says, Basi Legani, I came back to my garden. He calls the world my garden. So that was the Chiddush that the last Maime he gave out was before his Estalkas, what he was saying is I want you to know that the world is a garden. The world is a beautiful place. A garden can have weeds. You have to uh, weed out the weeds. A garden can have bacteria. A garden can have germs. A garden can have wild plants that have to be uprooted and you have to nurture a garden. That's true. There's thorns, and there could be various infections. You have to nurture a garden. You have to protect it. But essentially, it's a splendid place. You know, you go to beautiful gardens, the, bot <laughs> the botanical gardens. <laughs> so the Rebbe used to go for Tashlik, the botanical gardens. Whatever it is, it's, it's, a beautiful, it's, it's a place where you take a walk, it's romantic, it's exquisite, it's geschmack, it's delightful. So the Rebbe dedicated then the Fabreng in Yudshmat Lamed Beis to explain this Nakuda. 
that despite all of the suffering and all of the, what you might call trauma and brokenness and pain, the last message that the Bala Elula sent to the people, he wanted to impart to the Jewish people is Basi Ligani Achaisikal. I want you to know that life is beautiful. It's a garden. Yeah, God was expelled. There was a Chetet Sadas. There was a Kayim at Hevel. There was a Doin Enosh. There was a Mabel. There was a Doin Aflag. All the, there was a Zdoim. All the seven things. But, but when he comes back here with Moshe, he says, this is the place. The message was, to tell the people that you have to know, he said, as the Welt is Nishkin jungle, the Welt is a garden. The world is essentially not a jungle, it's a garden. And that's a Chiddush, because when you look at reality, you look at life, it's very easy to become pessimistic. Some people look at their own life, and there's this negative attitude. You look at yourself, you look at your history, and you say, this is a, it's, it's a bad world. There's a lot of depression, a lot of brokenness, as I said before. You look sometimes at your marriage, you look at your family, you look at your parnasi, you look at your parents, you look at your siblings, you look at friends, you look at people. There's a lot of prosperity. There's a lot of food at the Kiddush, and there's a lot of food at the Svabrengen. But on a deeper level, there's also a lot of despondency. There's people who don't know what's going on with themselves. There's teenagers overdosing every day. There's mental breakdowns and mental illness. There's people more and more disassociating and disconnecting. And it's very easy to become cynical. If you're naive, you don't become cynical. But if you have your open eyes and you see what's going on, right? And you're not living in, in, in your, your head in the sand, it's very easy to just become cynical. And when you become cynical, a piece of you dies. A piece of you dies. My son doesn't know what I'm talking about. Huh? Huh? Oh, you do understand what I'm talking about. Okay. So you understand, yeah. I hear you. I hear you, I hear you. I hear you. Chet. <laughs> Your name is Simchas. So you don't have all these problems. Simcha Bunim. Bedenem. Say Simcha, say Bunim. Pshischa. So now, Reb Simcha Bunim from Pshischa was once in Leipzig. He lived in Leipzig in Germany. And he used to like to go to the river, to the water. And they say a miser, he was once at the river. And he saw a fellow deep in the water, and there was an undercurrent, and the man was swept away by the tide, and he was drowning. And he was screaming, help! But Epsim Chabinim didn't know how to swim, certainly not on the level of a lifeguard. So he couldn't go and chop him. And this person, there was nobody there, there was no lifeguard, there was nobody there, and this poor man, this poor Jew, was going down, and Epsim Chabinim felt helpless. So what's that man? So he looked at this Jew and he said, At the gate start up, shik mein gerus to the Leviosa. When you get down, send my love and my warmest regards to the Leviosa. So the man started to laugh. <laughs> he started to laugh. And from the laughter, he, he, he garnered momentum and he got himself out. It looked like he was making a litzonus, right? On this person's judgment, he's about to die. He got him out. So Chassidim used to tell the story, and they said, Mayim Rabim, you know, the world, it's a crazy place, raging waters. You have to have a good sense of humor. Like the Alter Rebbe says in Tanya Perek Chavav, right? In the beginning of Perek Chavav, the Alter Rebbe gives a marshal for martial arts. You remember? It's a chidosh, the Alter Rebbe gives a marshal from wrestling and martial arts, and he says that victory is not reserved for the person who's stronger. Victory is reserved for the person who's happier. He's more uh, agile, more swift, more flexible, more open. That's what Alter Rebbe says there. He says the nefesh al is stronger, but if you're depressed, 
if you're anxious, if you're angry, you're not you're gonna lose. You're gonna lose. I know Trey Batchi, the Gamara says. I know Trey Batchi. You know, the mice with Elio Anovi. So this was a Maida de Kavart that Yud Shvat, what was his last message? I saw darkness. I saw it all. But I'm gonna leave you with Basilagani. I want you to be able to look at life and celebrate it. Well, they say in English, it takes one to know one. If you think about the Rebbe himself, he also, he saw a lot of pain in his personal life and in the life around him. He lived through every revolution in Jewish history of the last century, the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917. And in 1933, he was in Berlin when Hitler took over. He was in Berlin. That was the German, what happened in Germany. 1941, he escaped. He came to America. He saw what was happening in America. At the forefront of all the major upheavals of history of the 20th century that completely transformed the Jewish world. So generally, when you see so much, you become a little cynical. Even if you're a Maimon, but it's like you go into, uh, what's the word, uh, cruise control. Yeah, you dive in, you learn. Stayed, you're a Maimon, fine. But there's a certain deadness that sets in, a certain cynicism. The Nekud of Yud Shvat was, Basi Legani Achaisikam. Ike Shchine Betachtoinam Haisa. That ability to be able to say that despite everything, and despite everything that's real, it's true, it's not, it's not an illusion. We're not talking about naive people. There are people who, who are there. They're leaders. They see it. Despite everything, to be able to celebrate life, to be able to dance to the end of love, to be able to, to enjoy your relationships, your connections, your avoidance Hashem. There's a Yid, he lives on Montgomery Street in Kranai, his name is Abzalman Khanan. The Rebbe used to get around four, five, or six hundred letters a day. Those who remember, there were ma the mailman would come to 770 with three or four sacks, huge sacks of mail. This is before internet, before fax machines. So people wrote letters. Nobody writes letters anymore. And he would come and he would deliver it. And I remember I was like, I would always see the mailman come over with Shabbos, Monday, Tuesday, six days a week besides Sunday. Three or four huge sacks together, it could have been four, five, six hundred letters. When I was growing up, talking about the late 70s, the early 80s, later there was a fax machine, so people would fax 88, 88, but before that there was no fax machine, you sent the letter. Shabbos. I remember the mailman would come. Well, I heard from the Blake Groner. He told me he was the secretary, one of the secretaries of the Rebbe. The Rebbe did not allow him or anybody else to open letters. He didn't let anybody open, only himself. He told me once that somebody came on Yechidis. He was a mayor of a city. And he told the Rabbi Groner, he says, I have four secretaries to open letters. <laughs> and he... He can't, he can't get him a secretary to open up letters. I don't get so many letters. So Rabbi Grona told him. I heard this one. He said, well, he doesn't, the Rebbe doesn't let. He says it's private letters. He doesn't want anybody to read it. So he asked Label Groner if nobody could read it. So how does he answer it? He calls up the person. So he said he cuts out the signature. He cuts the signature so we know. And then he writes the answer. But he doesn't give us the letter. So we don't know what the person wrote. Because he doesn't want to, he feels that people are sharing their private lives. We shouldn't see it. See, the Rebbe would cut the signature so the, the secretaries would know who to send the answer to. And he would write the answer. But he wouldn't let them see the letter. Now, you, have you tried opening a few hundred letters a day? With your finger, yeah? With your finger. So one day Zalman Khan decided to buy a Sony uh, envelope opener. It's very good. You put the envelope in. <laughs> so he bought it. He gave it in. He gave it to Rabbi Yom. Rabbi Yom and Klein was another secretary. The Rebbe sent it back out. The Rebbe said it's making too much noise. <laughs> so he went to search for a silent uh, model. 
couldn't find. He called up Sony, called, they don't have it anymore. They used to have. He offered a lot of money, they found it in storage. He was so happy he got a silent one, doesn't make noise. He sent it into the Rebbe, so the Rebbe would be able to open the envelopes easily. He wouldn't, he wouldn't have to open it with his finger because nobody else would open them. The Rebbe sent it out again. He, he rejected it. <laughs> so the Rebbe told me, I'm inclined to tell him explanation. And he said that different people seal their envelopes in different ways. Some people seal their envelopes with glue, with scotch tape, with a stapler. And some people seal their envelopes with saliva. You know, I used to seal an envelope. Yeah. You seal it. He said, There's Jews, they seal their envelope with the tredin, with their tears. How am I going to open with a machine that which a Jew sealed with his tears? If you put a machine, you put the envelope under a machine, the machine is not going to pick up the tears. If I open it up with my hand, I can detect the tears. What the Rebbe was saying is that already when he opens the envelope, he's already touching the person. It's not just you reading the letter. Opening the envelope, you don't give it to a machine. You open it yourself. You're talking about a, a, a manik Yisrael who feels, I heard from Dr. Weiss, you know Dr. Weiss from Chicago? Huh? Not from Dr. Weiss. Dr. Robert Feldman. Dr. Robert Feldman, he passed away not long ago. You know Dr. Robert Feldman? He was a doctor on President Street. Huh? Who doesn't know Dr. Feldman? Everybody knows. Bob, <laughs> Bob Feldman, yeah. Robert <laughs> Feldman. Huh? Your pediatrician? <laughs> Yeah, he was very concerned, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I once heard from him, I heard from him directly that when the Rebbe had his heart attack by a coffers, so people would ask, the doctors told the Rebbe he should go to the hospital. The Rebbe refused. This was Shemini Yatzer, Tov 1977. So Dr. Feldman said, the Rebbe at some point said, you see this, he said in English to him, you see this room? So he said, yeah. So he said, over the last tens of years, tens of years, yeah, this room, the walls of this room absorbed the tears and the pain of tens of thousands of Jews. If I'm going to become healthy, it's going to be from this room. So you have to be sensitive to this, to understanding what it means to absorb tears. Despite all of this, and together with all of this, the Rebbe said, what was the last message that the Rebbe Rayats wanted to leave to Chesidim and to the Jewish people is, Bosi Legani Yechaisikal. Bosi Legani. Hashem calls this world a garden and my garden. Despite all the cynicism and all the challenges and all the brokenness, you should know that at the core... It's a world of beauty. It's a world of, of, of delight. It's a world of tainuk, of ecstasy. It's a world of oneness. It's a world of pleasure. It's a world of ikir shechina b'tachtoinim. We have to reveal it. We have to transform the darkness. You have to excavate the depth. You have to eliminate the germs and the bacteria and the weeds and the koitzim and the chuchim. You have to be zoymer. All the Hilchas Shabbos are discussing how you cultivate a garden. But at the core, you're dealing with a garden. So what does this mean in our lives? It means that sometimes... Drugs are just from a plant. Drugs are just from a plant. Drugs. Just from a plant. You mean, which drugs? Psychedelics? I don't know what drugs. Drugs come from plants. Yeah. Some, yeah, some plants are poisonous, but some plants are very powerful. <laughs> yeah. So what's the point? The point is... Yeah, You celebrate the gardens. The point is that in everybody's life, when you look at it, it's easy to become pessimistic. It's very easy to become cynical. Somebody once told me, he said, cynicism, right... Is, is basically, it's a form of fear. 
It's running away. It's retreating. You retreat. How do you retreat? When you become cynical, nobody's going to disappoint you. Because you already knew it. You know, when people are cynical, it's like, yeah, you know, sell me, sell me another bridge. When you're cynical, you don't believe anything. So you won't be disappointed. It's a way of protecting yourself against another dagger. Instead of you stabbing me, I already, I didn't trust. It's fine. The Chiddush of Basi Lagani is that you had there two manhigim, the Rebbe Dayatz and the Rebbe. They saw that they both observed and lived through the darkest periods of Jewish and human history. And they emerged and they said, yes, <laughs> but the world is still a garden. The Ra, the evil is not at the core. At the core, there's goodness. At the core is a lakus. Erdin Saif is Lamata Adin You have to be at Megala. You have to work hard to reveal it. But at the core, don't let brokenness prevail. Allow wholesomeness to prevail. Celebrate life. At the end of the day, it's a story of goodness. It's a story of hope. It's not a story of doom and failure and depression. And it changes everything. Sometimes you have a story in yourself and you say, this shows me that the world is a jungle. As they call it, I'm a sugar welt. Stuss. It's a place of stuss, of insanity. And it's a place of sheker, of lies. Kalas Basi Lagani, it says, from the shtus, you make atzi shittim. And from the sheker, you make kroshim. Kroshim. This is sheker. From the shtus, you make atzi shittim. You build the beams of the mishkin. And from the sheker, you make kroshim. What does it mean in a person's life? It means that even though sometimes our experience and our brain wants to go into the pessimistic and into doomsday and into the negative, the ultimate message is enjoy life, celebrate the world. I have two cousins, first cousins. My uncle had a fish store on Kingston Avenue. It's called Raskin's Fish Store. His name was Beto Raskin. He passed away some time ago, not long ago. Now his children took over the store. So when I went to his visit for Shiva, so I sat with his two daughters. His older daughter, his name is Brochela, and a younger daughter, next daughter is called, her name is Basi. Brochela is a richler, and Basi is a comart. But they're Raskin from their home. So we were schmoozing. It was at their father's shiva a few years ago. Two years ago, three years ago. So the two girls told me that Ebbetson, that Ebbetson's wife, would call the fish store to get fish. So once their father asked them to deliver the fish to the Ebbetson on President Street, the Ebbetson's house. They were Bishrifka girls, they were teenagers. One was around 16 and the other one was 14, 15, 14. A few years apart from each other. And he said, make sure you go and don't let the Rebetzin schlep the bags. There was a lot of fish. Make sure you go in and you put it where it has to be so she shouldn't have to schlep the fish. It was heavy. So these two girls went and they picked up the fish, Brachala and Basi. And they went to President Street where the Rebbe lived. And they came from the back door. There was a back door and they rang the bell. And the Rebetzin, Rebetzin Chaim Mushka opened the door. And they brought in the fish. She wanted to take the bags. They said, we want to bring it in. They brought in the fish. They put it wherever she wanted them to put it, in the refrigerator or the counter. And they were ready to leave. They dropped off the delivery. They were ready to leave. But the Rebbe stopped them. And she said, how are you? What are your names? Where do you learn? And she struck up a whole detailed conversation with them. What school do you go to? Who are your teachers? What subjects do you learn? Do you like school? Is school boring? Is school interesting? She gave them a thorough interview to find out what their hobbies are and what their interests are and how school is and what you learn and what's going on and the teachers. and She wanted to know everything about their lives. And they were, they were very happy to be able to talk to the Rebbe's wife and, 
They shared with her everything that she wanted to know. And then the conversation was over a few minutes later. And it was time to leave. So they were walking towards the door and they said goodbye. And she thanked them and they thanked her. And uh, they told me that Evanson looked up at them right when they were leaving. This is your teenagers, a 14-year-old and a 16-year-old. And she said, girls, girls, don't forget to enjoy life. And she bid them farewell. That's what they shared with me. I thought to myself, very interesting. Girls, don't forget to enjoy life. So I asked them, what did she mean? Like, why would they forget? Why would they forget? So one of my cousins, they're my first cousins, my mother and Mrs. Raskin are Lipskers, they're sisters. Bobby and Esther Raskin are sisters. No. Esther's daughters, Brachala and Basi, are two daughters. They went to deliver the fish to the Rebetzin. They said, you know, she was listening to them going to school and, you know, how boring some of the classes are. <laughs> you know, routine. You know, life gets tedious in your teenagers and life is not always simple. And she was telling them, girls, don't forget. Don't forget to enjoy life. Don't forget to enjoy life. But I found it very fascinating coming from her that Ebbetson didn't have children. She was a lonely person. And her, even her husband, she barely had. You know, he would come home. When, when, when the Rebbe became a Rebbe, the Ebbetson knew that it's not going to be easy. He would come home sometimes five in the morning, six in the morning, seven in the morning. It wasn't like he was, uh, I don't have to tell you how hard the Rebbe worked. And she didn't have her own family life. It was difficult. Things were difficult. But she told these girls, she said, you know, don't forget to enjoy life. Don't forget to celebrate relationships. Don't forget to celebrate your days, your nights. Don't forget to, to suck the marrow out of life, to enjoy it. In many ways, this was her father's message. Basi Lagani Echai Every one of us faces challenges. I don't know anybody who doesn't deal with some struggle. Everyone deals with struggles and challenges, physically, financially, emotionally, psychologically, spiritually, energetically, somatically, and sometimes all of them together, or at least one of them. It's very easy to get sucked in to the vortex of the hurricane. It's easy to get sucked into the whirlwind of the tsunami. It's easy to get sucked in to the storm. And you often become just like a, a, a negative person. And It's a dark world, and that's how it is. You know, you read Kehelis, and Shloyma uh, HaMelech <laughs> writes how everything is Hevel HaVolim, Hakel, Hakel Hevel. Vanity, oh vanity, everything is vanity. But the last maimah of Yud Shvat, the Friedrich Rebbe decided he's going to choose a posik from Shira Shirim. Nishvan Kehelis from Shira Shirim. Shira Shirim is Bosi Lagani, Achai Sikal. Ike Shchine Betachtoinam Haisa. That despite the Choshech Kafulim Chupul, at the core of everything is Gula. For Aritz Haisa Soyu Vavayu Vachoshech Apneisahayim. Says the Medrash, the ability to be able to see love, to feel love, to experience love. You can only do that if you find it in yourself. So I said, Avas And when you can do it within yourself, you can give it to others. But the last message was a message. He lived through Hitler, Stalin, had Finster of El, Tovshin Yud. Everybody was sitting Shiva still. It was five years after Auschwitz. What's there to celebrate? At best, you survived. The message was no. The good is going to prevail, the, the happiness is going to prevail, love will prevail. And the Rebbe started to embody that, and he wouldn't flinch. 
despite disappointments and frustration and setbacks and failure, very easy to become cynical and dismiss. It's a lot of pain. But he remained an ambassador, a steadfast anchor, meeting every person and just having the same message, and that is, you're a piece of infinity. And the moments I'm spending time with you is going to be dedicated to reveal how powerful you are, how good you are. And that's the transition from Golos into a place of Gula. The Shlafs. You have to have a relationship, you have to have a higher, a higher reality. I once heard from the Rebbe, I saw it from the Ruzhina, from the Bissot Rebbe, I heard from the Rebbe by Fabrengen. He said from Baba Metziah, Yir Shalai Midas. You remember Abaya and Rava? Yush is Shaloi Midas. If there's Yush, it's because there was no Das. Was it bechayet for them? No Nalef, Tavshin, no Nalef, one of those. Yush is Shaloi Midas. If there was Das, there'd be no Yush. As if you're stuck in Das, there's no Yush. Now, sometimes there's no Das. Ain't a Chinami. Ain't on the Ella Bedas. I says, I'm going to go out in the Dodim. Ain't on the Ella Bedea. Ain't Osh Ella Bedea. Well, Shemtiv said that Golos and Gola is Soid Hadas. It's perception. The Rebbe used to say, Gola is the same letters like Gola. The difference is if there's an Aleph. If you see the Aleph, Bossi Lagani, you see Gola, you see the Aleph, the Alufer Shaloylam. Doesn't mean there's no goyle. Gula doesn't mean there's no gollus. It means the goyle becomes gula because you put in the olive. Gula doesn't mean the circumstances change. You have a new wife, a new husband, new kids. No! You come home to the same Meshugana Matzav in Pomona. Oh, I forgot. Pomona is Ganadin. Okay, do Wesley Hills if you want. One is going to eat an alien. What's this going to eat in Atachten? Brooklyn is uh, whatever. That's where you ran away from. Huh? Massive migration to the natural habitat of the Jewish people in Muncie. The natural habitat of the Amish is in Pennsylvania and the Jews in Pomona or Miami or the Hamptons. The same, it's Goyla. You, you see the Aleph. You put on the glasses, you see the Aleph. The same matzah, but you see gula. It's not that the words change. You put the aleph into the gula is gula. That's what you mean, yeah? Huh? The psimch is maskim. Huh? The psimch says it's all It's all poshut. No, on Yeah, yeah, I hear you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You get stuck in the So that's the question deep down in your core. Do you see the world as hopeless or hopeful? Deep down, deep down in your nervous system, in your goof. When you wake up in the morning, what's your instinctive response? Is it Negative or positive? Do you see the world from a vantage point of darkness, or vantage point of brightness? You can't force it. My words are not going to change it because it's deep inside of you. Huh? That's a good question. He's practical. He's asking, depends if the baby slept through the night. The baby slept through the night, it's Bossi Lagani. If the baby didn't sleep through the night, <laughs> you got to deal with a chaisi kala. <laughs> and all the ramifications. And then you know where you're going to end up is going to be kol doidi doifik. Peace, I want to come back. 
Achosi, Rayasi, Einasi, Samasi. Shiroishi Nimla Tal. Futsoisai Risise Loila. Yeah? Shiroishi Nimla Tal. Shashidim. My head is filled with dew. I'm outside. My head is filled with dew. I want to come in. Futsoisai Risise Loila. The strands of my hair are filled with the, the wetness of night. Futsoisai Risise Loila. The Kala is telling the Chassan. No, the Chassan is telling the Kala, let me in. The Kala said, Pashata ti es kutanti echoch al b'shena. Rechatz ti es raglai echoch. I went to sleep already. I took off my ksoinas. I'm wearing pajamas. You want me to get dressed? Rechatz ti es raglai. I'm in bed. Echoch atanfa. You want me to get my feet dirty and go to the door and get muddy? And he's begging, he's saying, I'm outside, I can't take it here. It's dark, it's wet, it's muddy, it's depressing. So whenever it says day in the who's referring to? Who's saying day in the It depends, it's the kala to the chasen or the chasen to the kala. Put him tov shin chaf, that ever said the whole story in, in, in Ruchnius, and he was sobbing, he was sobbing. Put him tov shin chaf, and then put him tov shin chaf gimel again. So what's the Nekuda? The Nekuda is that the Baal Shem Tov said you have to stop singing Eicha, start singing Shir Hashirim. It's not words. It's to be able to feel the Avas Oilam that ever wanted to provide for people the, the, the safety, the inner comfort. It's not through words. It's an inner, inner sense that you could, you could trust. We have to be able to do it for each other, and then we could do it for ourselves and for our children. Basilagani, everything changes with Basilagani. If the world is a jungle or the world is a garden, it's a different world. The question is, what are you, what are you, what are inside? What are you really feeling? Deep inside, when you talk to God, is He a threatening monster? Or is it a loving embrace? It's not so simple. Huh? Not so simple. Beis was this that the last message, Ani Hagaverani, you would think such a life, this wouldn't be the last message. As measure was Bossi Lagani, Sagartan. You have to be very connected for this. You have to believe to see people and see Ein Soif in them. Really be able to see that. It's not simple because all the cynicism comes in and it distracts you. And you want to just reject them. Especially people who are close to you and they disappoint you. It's hard. Right? When you love them and they disappoint you, you want to... You want to reject that ability to be able to be present. Because you love them so much. Of course, because you love them, they cause you so much. If you don't love them, they wouldn't cause you pain. Irrelevant. They'll be irrelevant. You could reject them, you can amputate yeah. them. When they're part of you, it triggers you so deeply. To be able to remain present, that's the union of Eirin Seifel Mata, the Tachlis, that's a chilek of Basi Lagani. The Maim Purim Tav Shem Chaf, he spoke a lot about this union of the Shir Hashirim, the Kvutsaysa Shiroi Shinim Latal, the Pchias, the Kol Doidi Doifek. Balayla Hu Nadada. Has Shir Naran Genom in the first Zach, what's he said that Al Shem Tav Shem Chaf? Where the Bali Menagadim? 
It was a Maimah from Tofresh Pei Gimel. But Parshas boy, but Tofshin Yudi gave it out with a new beginning, Bossi Lagami. And he made Kitsudim, he made abbreviations. The Maimah was set, Tofresh Pei Gimel, 1923. Pei Gimel, 23. Yudshma Tofshin Memvav, Sefer Mamorim Pei Gimel came out. So by the Fabrengen, before Yitzhak, the Rebbe spoke a lot about that. Those were the Maimonim of Bossi Lagani. In fact, the Rebbe came to the Friedrich the Rebbe, Tafresh Pegimel Sukkis. Those were the first Maimonim. Huh? Yeah, came Sukkis Pegimel. There was a diary from Rabbi Chadukov, Tafshin Tezayin. The Rebbe told them, the first time I saw the Rebbe was Sukkis Pegimel. And when was this one? The man was at Parsha's boy. Tafresh Pei Gimel, 1923. It was, it was published of Shinyud as Basi Lagani. He re-edited and wrote Kitsurim and he gave it out. has 20 prok and 20 chapters. Yud Shabbat 5, Yud Gimel 5, Purim 5, Beis Nisim 5. Purim 5, that's a separate...